This week, we are continuing on our series on artificial intelligence and technology and so on with another solo show. And for the people who are watching this on the live stream, that's not biscotti sauce underneath my mouth there. That's human blood. Uh, <laughs> so how the solo shows and live streams come together is the night before, because it's Friday morning here for me, I make some notes and what have you. And then I get up at about 5 a.m., maybe a little bit before, and I put it all together in some slides. Uh, and then with, frankly, too little time to spare, I go and ablute and shower and get ready for the show. And for whatever reason, now I've been shaving for 25 years. This time I decided rather than going down with the razor, I would go sideways <laughs> just underneath my mouth. So this might be one to listen to rather than watch, but you're here now. Uh, and it was really interesting to look at yourself in the mirror holding a tool as blood streams down your face while you are waiting to begin a show talking about human understandings of tools and technology and so on. It's a really interesting kind of moment, <laughs> but uh, that explains what's going on here. And I should catch you up as people are jumping into the chat on other stuff. Uh, oh, I should also mention if you're watching this, that's why I'm in uh, unhoused level clothing. This is a, an old farm hoodie because I can't, I actually had nice new clothing that I'd purchased <laughs> to wear, uh, but I would get blood on my new top. So here we are in, uh, in let's say farm clothing. But yeah, so the last couple of weeks, I have been in Vanuatu, which if you've read some of the uh, previous posts, you'd be aware of, or if you're a premium member, some of the technical difficulties uh, that come with being on an island of an island of an island that has generator power and sometimes uh, 4G data access. That's relevant for this show because it's where I put together my thinking uh, around the stuff I want to talk about. And it was, as, as we move into the presentation, it will be obvious why that was the right context to have this aspect of the AI discussion in this way. Uh, and I will just say for those of you listening, uh, the video version will definitely have a live stream Q&A at the end, as we do with these live stream solo shows. Uh, and what I might depending on where we go with the questions, if you're listening to this right now, rather than watching it live, you know, if the file's quite big, if it's a two hour or two and a half hour uh, MP3, then we have in fact included the Q&A uh, at the end. Because depending on how it goes, I I'm expecting we're going to get more questions that are relevant to the topic at hand, which means it might actually be useful or interesting for those of you listening along on the MP3 replay. But for those of us who are not, we let us jump on into the uh, solo show, uh, to the presentation rather. And again, if you're listening to it, the presentation is, as is now traditional, uh, <laughs> it is a AI, which is relevant, obviously. It is an AI slide show from the Gamma app uh, using AI-generated images. So you're missing nothing. This is really just to make sure I hit all the points that I need to hit in the show. It's I'm always making certain that the audio version is as good obviously, uh, as the video version, because the vast majority of you still listen. And indeed, that's still how I consume the majority of my podcasts. But here we go. Moving in, I have titled this presentation Million Dollar Beach, and that will be relevant as we move through the presentation. Hang on a minute. Click. So this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about ruins to begin with, and this is why I had to wait until last week's show dropped with Dougal Hine because of his book, At Work in the Ruins. That's gonna, we start there. We start with this idea of ruination and what it is we inhabit. And then we have to talk about tools in general, right? Because too much of the conversation around AI is about the, and it's not that this is bad, this is quite important, the metaphysics of intelligence, right? Which is to say, are there forms of thinking that aren't human? And the obvious answer for that, especially if you're animist, is of course, yes. Not enough of the discussion is around the notion of artifice, you know, the, the actual artificial in AI. So that's where a lot of the exploration this week is going to situate itself. And then we're gonna have a little bit of uh, a look at prophecy because again, uh, we are a couple of episodes from the last solo show about prophecy, and you can kind of see what I'm doing here, right? Like we're exploring a very big topic 
in a sequence of solo shows. So if you haven't listened to that one, although I will say this once we get to that uh, section, that one's a good companion piece for this, for that section. All right, and then the final one I'm, I refuse to explain until we get to it is called Rock Wisdom. And I'm gonna to talk to you about an amazing fundraiser that uh, Rune Soup is involved in. So let's begin with Ruination. Uh, if you have listened to, which you should, because it's a fantastic discussion, last week's show with Dougald Hein, uh, on the occasion of the publication of his book, At Work in the Ruins, he mentioned that he voiced the audiobook for uh, Vanessa Mercado de Oliveira's Hospicing Modernity. And we had a good chat during my show about that term because it's perfect. And anyway, uh, well, what was also perfect was listening to Dougald, so one of the co-originators of the Dark Mountain Project, <clears throat> in my head, I got the audiobook. Uh, <laughs> telling the story of how his indigenous grandmother really influenced his life as a Brazilian woman. Because as he mentioned on the show, uh, he, Vanessa didn't, he initially said no to Vanessa, they're friends, right? Uh, to say, I can't, I've got a white English accent, I can't be voicing a Brazilian woman's book. And she basically said that's exactly why you should do it. And when you listen to it, I absolutely get what she means. Because first of all, you know, Dougal has a nice voice and they're friends. And so there's the, the human connection, but I'm really aware of bodies and, and the difference of them when I listen to Dougal <laughs> describe Vanessa's experience. Um, I did also buy a copy of the book because there were sort of too many points where I'm like, ah, that's a really good quote. Uh, what am I getting? Yeah, you know, that I'm sure for regular audiobook listeners, <laughs> You end up doing the same thing pretty often. So that's what I was listening to. And I was also reading Cloud Atlas, which I've never read before. I know that sounds odd. Uh, talking to Kelsey about this, they were shocked that uh, <laughs> it's my favorite movie, as I've mentioned many times before. First of all, the movie, here's, here's my quick review of a book that came out almost 20 years ago. The movie's better, which puts it in a rare uh, category, actually, but it just is. The Wachowski siblings did... Uh, a more relevant, dare I say, a job of a fantastic story. But what is different, and not necessarily better, is remember the, the future Hawaii sequence in the movie. And by the way, it came out more than 10 years ago. So if you're worried about spoilers, sit down. Uh, you know, the, you've, you've had more than enough time to watch this film. But recall that Halle Berry's character in the future Hawaii sequence was trying to get to the top of some mountain in ruined Hawaii to activate some kind of receiver to communicate with off-planet humans to come and rescue them. That isn't there in the book. The off-planet human civilization isn't there in the book. That's not how it ends. Uh, they basically go to the radio telescope, obviously in ruined state, that's in Hawaii now in the book. And so <laughs> I'm reading this book about ruins and hospicing modernity or listening to this book about hospicing modernity and thinking about ruins and, and what it is that we inhabit, particularly from a technological basis. And here's this story of the far future discussing the oldens, which is us, but maybe a little bit further along the timeline and their failed civilization and them having to live in the ruins themselves. And what I'm doing this is I snorkel at a place called Million Dollar Beach in uh, Vanuatu uh, on an island called Espiritu Santo. Now, at the end of World War II, because this is also relevant, like I, we were sitting there <laughs> looking at a river stretch where three different presidents, so Nixon, Carter, and JFK, were all, all participated in the war from exactly here. And we're on the eve of World War III. So there's all these things that are incorporated into my thinking with this notion of technology and ruins and so on. But Million Dollar Beach is a stretch of land where at the end of the war, the Americans, which is shades of Afghanistan, had all this tech left over that they didn't want to bring home with them. Uh, and so depending on whose story you believe or listen to, they were trying to get the condominium government of Vanuatu to purchase it. Now, the condominium is like a double empire. So it was co-administered by the French and the English. And the English in particular, I suspect, were calling the Americans bluff. Like if, they, if we don't pay for it, they're gonna have to leave it anyway. So we're not going to pay for it. And the Americans got down to $1 a Jeep and the condominium government still said no. And so the Americans disabled all the equipment so that it couldn't be used and tipped it overboard. 
And so along this beach, there is now obviously 70, 80 years old, ruined more. Yeah, 80, 90 years old, uh, ruined tech. And of course, it's been so long that it's uh, coils of metal, like the stuff I'm holding and old tires and, and, and half reef. And it's this perfect place to be swimming as you're uh, listening to Dougald voice Vanessa's work, reading Cloud Atlas, thinking with war and hubris and ruination and so on. And you're doing all of this on Carver, <laughs> uh, high amounts of it, in fact. And this is where I just have to fold strange other parts of being on quests in, uh, because the guy in Vanuatu who introduced me to the best place to get Carver, which began my uh, Carver experience over the two and a half weeks I was there, was actually Filipino. It was this guy who worked in a hardware store in Port Vila. And not just was he Filipino, but he's from the island of Mindanao, which is the island you look at from Sikihor, where I just was, the island of the witches. So here's a guy who was in sight, who grew up in sight of where I just was on the, the same quest for the material that's going into the final book of the Dot trilogy. And the guy who introduced me to the Kava, which has uh, opened the doors for the material that's going to end up in the book in addition, literally inside of the island I was from. And it's one of those of all the gin joints kind of moments that makes you realize you are on some kind of quest. Anyway, the, by the time we got to the hotel, so I went first to Vanuatu and did the, the research work. And then James and I attempted to have our first holiday, uh, actual holiday since 2019. My uncle died uh, towards the end of it. So we had to cut it in half. And so we spent a week on a beach and as a result, spent a week in airports uh, getting to a funeral and back because of course, that's what you do. Uh, anyway. The, the week that we had in Vanuatu, uh, which was beach stuff and, and actual attempts at relaxing, uh, which is a, a big thing I need to work on from an anxiety and stress perspective, uh, we would get the staff boat from our island to the docks of Luganville with a one and a half liter plastic bottle uh, and, and go to the cover bar and get it filled with cover and bring it back and, and be drinking a liter of cover a, a day. And... It was sort of a, I wouldn't call it a cava dieta because let's just say I did not have, uh, it, the, the dieta rules didn't apply. I was eating resort food for two weeks, which means the monthly fast is uh, coming up, put it that way. Anyway, this, cava does some really interesting stuff to your dreams. My experience of it, in, in high doses at least, because it has a anti-anxiety effect that lasts over 36 hours, so it's not just as you drink it, it felt to me like my psyche was using that opportunity in dream to outgas some stuff that I'd been hanging on to for too long. So it's almost like it had its own purge component, but it wasn't buckets during ceremony. It was when you went to sleep afterwards. Very interesting. But consequently, so my dreams and my thoughts are all folding in together with this notion of ruination. And I just have to tell you, it is a recipe for slipping dimensions <laughs> to put all of these things together. So even when I holiday, I, um, I holiday chaos magic style, I suppose. The other component that is going to be crucial to this discussion of tools and AI that needs to be folded in now is I am rereading Ivan Illich. And it's because there was the three uh, synchronicities or three bells rung to suggest it's time to go back. And the first one was about a month or two ago, maybe longer now, Dr. Tom Cowan on one of his weekly Q and A's mentioned Ivan Illich and unsurprisingly now that I think about it, how much of an influence Illich was, particularly his work, Medical Nemesis, on Dr. Cowan's thinking. And so that was the first thing because I had read Medical Nemesis years ago when putting together the Apocalypse Pharmaca series for the blog. And when Tom Cowan mentioned it, I'm like, okay, I maybe I need to revisit this. And then Illich is mentioned in Dougald's book, At Work in the Ruins. So the ding, 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 that's two. And then I was talking to Reverend Danny Nimu on Telegram and he mentioned, which is true, that if you've medical nemesis, it's 50 years old and it completely unpicks and presents an inarguable position as to, well, let's just say the last three years of biotyrannical nonsense we've been through. So you can kind of tell the people 
who read it, <laughs> dare I say, picked the more sophisticated position over what it, what just happened and is continuing to happen. But let me tell you a bit about him if you are unfamiliar with Ivan Illich. So born in 1926, died 2002 in Austria, although of uh, Dalmatian extraction kind of. He was a Roman Catholic priest and a philosopher and a sort of anti-activist. So one of the his most powerful statements is around the, he was opposed to development work. And he actually ran a facility in Mexico for over a decade that was essentially anti-aid and anti-development work for reasons you will hear as we move further on. He was the author of pamphlets rather than books. So uh, if you are a premium member Let's just say they're very easy to find in the file room on the Ansible, if any of this tickles your fancy. Deschooling society, medical nemesis, and so on. Now, listen, oh, reading him through in Vanuatu again, it occurs to me he's, if we were creating the right kind of saints again, he might have been one of them, although not so much with the miracles. So he may perhaps have been more like a prophet or even better, a church father. Because one, he was in dialogue with church fathers and, and those sort of thinkers himself. But the material that he was putting out was never uh, opposed to the church, but although he refused for decades because of the church's behavior in Latin America and so on to ever administer mass and so on. So he rejected all the, the good, but let's say the benefits of being a priest. And this was all towards improving the church. Like the, it was a loving uh, a loving critique rather than a, you must, like, we must stop this organization. It was this organization must return to what it was, if that makes sense. Uh, he described development, as, and this is a quote from In Conversation. So the other thing I should mention is perhaps if you've never heard of Ivan Illich before, one of the best ways in is a book that came out, I think, in the early 90s, which, uh, it, so he wrote mostly during the 60s and 70s. And in his elder years, he finally consented to being interviewed by a Canadian journalist who had spent some time with him at his facility down in Mexico uh, about 15 years before. And he initially said no, and it's this whole thing. This is the trouble with mystics, right? Um, and so there's this very interesting, somewhat dated book called In Conversation, which is often a good way into Illich. So I'm going to quote from that. Uh, Illich described development as a war on subsistence and argued that it would disrupt the existing adaptations of peoples to their circumstances without furnishing any real alternative. Rich nations, he wrote in 1968, now benevolently, benevolently impose a straitjacket of traffic jams, hospital confinements, and classrooms on the poor nations and by international agreement call this development. So I'm rereading Illich and Illich has a metaphysics of tools. That's why the rereading was useful in Vanuatu and useful for this discussion. Tools, according to Illich, can be a hammer, obviously, or they can be the modern medical system, they can be Western education, they can be a highway, they can be farming, okay? So tool, he deliberately used as a term because it was more pointed and more humble than something like technology or platform. So when we talk about the metaphysics of tools, which we're going to do in this show so that we can turn some of that thinking towards artificial intelligence, that's what Illich means by a tool. He means both a hammer and, let's say, the American medical system. Both are tools, right? And the first time I read through this, it came into pieces of eight when we talk about Lucifer, Trickster, and the lie. Trickster is the original god and the lie and that ancient eternal question of what it is about humans that are different and how and why we are different to the rest of the cosmos. And I remember this conversation quite well uh, but with myself and Peter Graves, Scarlet Imprint, in a pub last couple of days I had in London think. Yes, it was. And the difference, one of the ways that separates humans out, he called the lie, right? It's that uh, apple moment in the garden. And everywhere around the world has been dealing with the what it is that is different about us. And invariably, it comes back to this very ancient form that we might as well call the trickster, of which Lucifer is, of course, one uh, emanation, I guess we could 
mention it, right? So that's this idea of tools for Illich is very important when it comes to, well, his metaphysics of tools is very important when it comes to understanding where we are and, and what's going on. And for, for Illich, tools go through two watersheds, two moments. Uh, and the first is when they are productive and useful, it's beginnings of agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then there comes a time where they become counterproductive and turn from a means to an end into something they fulfill themselves. And the example, bearing in mind this is the 60s and 70s, that Illich would use is cars, automobiles. So the automobile expands mobility until it doesn't, until it slows it down, right? So one car or a couple of hundred cars is great. <laughs> once, once it gets to a certain density in a city, it actually slows up. Uh, and also you're kind of forced into a commute to pay for the car, so more people have them. So the technology that expands mobility reaches a point where it contracts mobility. And healthcare is the other example, right? So there was a, and he, he saw this in the 60s and 70s. There was a moment where allopathic medicine, and, and the, I think it gets too much credit, frankly, because it was good hygiene and judicious application of antibiotics that did it and essentially nothing else. But also nutrition is my point. Like nutrition actually gets most of the uh, benefit for this. But there was a point in the 20th century where allopathic medicine at least took credit for the expansion of, uh, you know, average lifespan. And then it didn't. And now we are, in fact, at least in the West, at least in America and realistically everywhere else, backsliding. And we were before the dramatic rise in iatrogenic deaths that have happened, which is to say doctor-caused deaths. That's what iatrogenic means over the last three years, particularly in the United States. Uh, and just look at the rise of chronic disease from when he was writing this in the 70s, less than 4% of American children had a chronic disease. And now it is almost 50%. So... The idea that Illich has with tools is that they work until they don't, and then they go backwards, at least from a benefit to humans perspective and basically benefits to the cosmos perspective. So that's part of the metaphysics of tools that is going to be relevant as we move through. By the way, that's my dive guide in the USS Coolidge, which <laughs> as gays, we could not not dive on when we are in Vanuatu, but it's also, I would say, the best wreck dive in the Pacific outside of Guam or Chuuk, probably even excluding Chuuk from that. And it is a World War II wreck, a US World War II wreck, but the USS Coolidge was a converted, uh, it was a converted cruise ship that ran into the Americans' own mines uh, and sank. So the enemy didn't sink this, the Americans sank their own ship. But because it's a cruise ship, it's enormous. And it's just really funny to think of uh, the Coolidge lies in shallow uh, tropical waters on her port side. And I'm not sure if I'm talking about the amazing Jennifer or the ship <laughs> when I say that. Because I could, you, if you just heard that, like, oh yeah, Coolidge is lying gloriously and magnificently on her port side in shallow tropical waters in the South Pacific, you'd be like, yeah, that's exactly where she is. Anyway, unrelated, that's for the people watching it, but that was an image on the presentation. So Illich's metaphysics of tools relies heavily on a 12th century thinker called Hugh of St. Victor that he was very, 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 frankly, inspired by and transformed by, to the point that as I was putting these slides together this morning, I'm like, maybe Hugh of St. Victor was a previous incarnation of Illich. Who knows? But uh, I'll, I'll quote from the book again. Uh, this is Illich saying this, careful systematic reflection on what constitutes a tool suddenly appears in the 12th century. Of course, we're talking about European thought here. A tool is the physical shape given by man to something natural for the purpose of getting him from intention to end, which is great. I describe it differently, but that is that extension of self notion that I mentioned in Pieces of Eight. Hugh of St. Victor developed a philosophical theology of technology in which technology is an activity by which man, thanks to what God has given him in creation, recovers part of what he has lost through his ecological intervention, which was sin. 
So this is a very animist slash hermetic slash permacultural position. Let me have him re-describe it and then we'll talk about it for clarity. Tool making, according to Hume, is a kind of penitential activity, an effort to make the sin with which we are born, which we have inherited, a little less unpleasant by reducing cold and hunger and weakness. So Hugh decided technology was the uh, faithful use of things that exist in creation to make the conditions of life down here, which can be hard and sad and painful, a little less hard and sad and painful. So it is a co-creation with God play described otherwise, which is why I say it's very hermetic. Uh, hermetic thought holds, and mostly correctly, as in this is a correct, well, this is a, an hermetic def description of something which is true, which is our co-creative relationship to the cosmos. But what Hugh of St. Victor does, of course, described in notions of original sin and so on, which people can take or leave, obviously. It's the 12th century. Come on now. But basically what he's got there is uh, God kicked us out of the garden into a world that is consequently painful and blah, blah, blah. But he kicked us out into a creation where there are things available to us that can make it better uh, for that reason. So it is not a... Uh, removal of sin as much as because God loved us, we have, or loves us, I don't, it's 12th century, I'm just going to go past tense. There are things in creation that we can use, I would say, align with or co-create with to make things a little bit better. That's very animist in a shamanic or aboriginal sense where that is absolutely what humans are for. And you take away, you strip away the make it a little bit better, fallen state, original sin. And what you have is that one of the crucial roles of the human is completion of creation via co-creation. So this is the thinking that powerfully transformed Illich's thought. And I'm just going to go back to finish the quotation. Because so Hugh writes this in the 12th century, Hugh of St. Victor, and within 50 years, by the 13th century, technology was already treated in thought and not only in practice as a means to subdue the earth and was spoken about that way. So Illich not only found the guy who developed what he thought was the first and best, to some extent, only theology of technology, but he also noticed that within 50 years, we'd got it wrong and it's drill, baby, drill. Even back in, that's not, <laughs> that's just something we seem to do. And the the how and why obviously is framed in a very Catholic sense when it comes to Illich, but there's, there's, much to, there's much to think with in it. Because this is the sin of the demiurge described otherwise, which I've been talking about for more than a decade. So uh, the way the book in conversation is written is almost like a play. So it's, it's, it's a transcription of, uh, audio discussions, cleaned up, obviously. And so in, from this bit of the book, Illich says, the overwhelming view of what tool making means can be summed up in the phrase, making the world a better place to live in. But Hugh says, if I understand him correctly, that tools are an assistance to remedy a little bit of the damage we have done to the world. It's a humble view of tools. Now, if you've done the foundations or any of the, the work that I've got in the members area that's inspired by, amongst other things, uh, Sutu Hill uh, shamanism and Martin Prechtel, this, the role of someone who does magic, let's say, is to more or less uh, restore some of the damage being human <laughs> makes in the cosmos. I'm very resonant with, uh, with what Illich is saying here. So anyway, it's a humble view of tools. And then Kaylee says, so this remedial approach is self-limiting as opposed to a more open air attempt to establish, and Illich says, something better than the creator provided. So to re-describe that, Hugh of St. Victor says that it, tools are an assistance given by God to help us remedy a little bit of the damage we have caused in the cosmos. And that view is humble and self-limiting. So we put 
psychic constraints on this notion of tools, because if we don't, we drop into the idea that technology is something that is used to create something better than the creator provided. That's the sin of the demiurge. So, you know, the, the pleroma manifests the cosmos and the demiurge says, I can do this motherfucking better and creates the physical realm that we're in. It's that reaching beyond the the cosmic role of what a tool is. So that's that informed... Consequently, everything that you see underneath Illich's thought when it comes to, quote unquote, modern medicine, development, education, and so on. So tools theory is a form of self-awareness, which is to say your metaphysics of tools describe where you think the boundary of your role and obligation exists in a co-creative universe. So... To, quoting from the book again in conversation, tools in Illich's sense amplify and entrain our senses and so belong to the physical realm of soil and body above which Western philosophy has soared. In his constantly reiterated insistence on limits as a condition of meaning and suffering as the expression of this experience, he has tried to show that these limits are inherent in embodied existence. Tools can remedy the ills of the body as agriculture can improve soil, but only to a point. Beyond that point lies dispersion, grandiosity, and ultimately nemesis. So tools in the metaphysics of sense aren't inherently, let's say, Luciferian demiurgic. They become so when we pridefully overextend beyond the cosmovision that birthed them. This is what I mean by your understanding of tools will, is also a description of where you think the permeable boundary between your temporary self and the rest of the cosmos exists. Because in there is like, well, how do I, how do I being in a universe of beings, composed of beings? This is a, a metaphysics of tools discussion. Because if you think you can do it better, or if you think I will use these things to last forever in a physical form, you, you step outside into grandiosity, dispersion, and nemesis. So I was thinking as of putting this together, can we call this the Babel point? Because again, Dr. Farrell, years ago now, had a book, but he talks about the Tower of Babel moment, which I, I riffed on to say that the Tower of Babel is, if you view it, you step out from flatland, and look at it hyperdimensionally, the Tower of Babel is a space-time specific description of what's going on in on this slide, if you're watching it, which is that idea that if you, when tools as a metaphysics step outside the cosmovision that creates them, when they, they say they can perfect the cosmos or run it better, uh, that's the Babel point. So the, the Tower of Babel is is hyperdimensionally true everywhere. And it's described as that in a, in a particular uh, place time, this time uh, discussion or place time cosmovision and story. So how does that work for tools of the magician then? Well, plainly, uh, more than most magicians require a metaphysics of tools. Uh, and I, again, hence the discussion in Pieces of Eight. You can, didn't realize this until I was putting the slides together this morning, make the case that magic is a metaphysics of tools, particularly if we go with Illich's understanding of what a tool is. Okay, and this gets back to uh, a couple of things. The ongoing exploration of a, de a personal definition of magic that is a big part of what's going on with the foundations in the members area, and also a post on the definition of magic that happened while I was in Vanuatu, possibly in Port Vila, which I will hopefully remember to put in the show notes. If not, just scroll back two or three posts from this one and you will get it because co-creative capacity that my definition currently of magic swings on speaks to this idea of a metaphysics of tools, right? So all of that is the preamble to, okay, fair enough. When it comes to the fears and speculation around AI and sentience and its status as a life form, I just want to move it into the artifice discussion by posing the question, what magical tools do you use that aren't 
some form of alive. And in the first section of the foundations, we devote quite a bit of time to this for this very reason, that in many respects, magic is a metaphysics of tools. But what isn't alive? If we're worried about, ah, is AI alive or will it become alive? It's like, hang on, what have you got in your spirit room? <laughs> this is something we've been doing forever, okay? Uh, but crucially, when it comes to AI and, and how that gets incorporated into your ongoingness, magical or otherwise, tools shape our perceptions of reality. And here's what I believe is a final quote from In Conversation. So this is an Illich quote. People in highly capitalized countries, which is to say the ones that you are probably listening to or watching this in, have acquired iatrogenic bodies. They perceive themselves and their bodies as doctors describe them. Now, this is at least part of why I suspect, I didn't ask, uh, Danny Nemo says, medical nemesis has the completely inarguable undoing of what we just went through. Uh, they perceive their bodies as doctors describe them. And consider that a real blunt version of that is diseased or not, with a specific disease or not, or um, medication status or not, your body and how it operates in, I don't even want to say society, in, in the physical realm is as described iatrogenically by doctors, particularly if you had the singular pleasure of spending that time in Australia where we went nuts for those check-ins and passports and so on. But more than that, <clears throat> It expands out to areas that I think are going to become increasingly important, and I am throwing it out there for, for guests to really weigh into this with. Connor Habib and I, in our uh, annual solo or annual New Year shows, for years there, for a while, were talking about, because it was happening, the, the manifestation of trans phenomena and what that means for society, for the cosmos, and so on. One of the things I said that uh, was a unheeded warning, not that I'm boss of this, was that if we chase the turfs down the materialism route, we will lose. And that's where we are. So instead, this is a good example of that, right? Because if we allow bodies to be described iatrogenically, we've already lost. And instead of having the more important conversations, we're forced into having a take about a social media campaign for possibly the world's most disgusting beer. And... At that point, I just have to throw my hands up and go, we've like, this is a weird, this just came into my mind, so I'm going to go with it. In the, uh, the prequels to the Star Wars films, when Yoda loses his lightsaber fight and he drops through and Jimmy Smith picks him up in the hover car and he's like, failed I have, into hiding I must go. <laughs> when the Dylan Mulvaney moment happened, it's like, ooh, oh, let's try this again later, right? But this is a, a tool shape our perceptions of reality uh, and a tool in this case being iatrogenic medicine or iatrogenesis itself doesn't just mean the moment we've been through in the last three years. It means everything. It means that as well. This is magicians have to be better at this. Magicians have to have the ultimate. And I don't mean like the they have to have the best metaphysics of tools upon which every uh, before which everyone must bow. I mean... This might be it. <laughs> this might be how you do magic, you know? All right, moving along. <clears throat> so speaking of chasing turfs, uh, cyborg theocracy is a term I heard from writer Mary Harrington, who writes for Unheard. That's actually when the name was like, oh, who is that? That's what it, uh, it, it triggered for me because that's where she wrote. But I listened to her on Red Scare whilst I was in this part of that, that ferment and and blend of sources that happened while I was in Vanuatu. Uh, in fact, on the flight home for my, well, the, the many flights home for my uncle's funeral, I was listening to her interviewed by the Red Scare Girls. And she mentions, we live in a cyborg theocracy. That's the, the overall cosmovision, like sin of the demiurge, technocracy. I love cyborg theocracy. I think that's perfect because it captures that we're expected, we are only complete when we are half technological at least. And the theocracy part is like, you must submit to this or you'll have your hand cut off or thrown off a building in that real theocratically violent sense. Um, 
she, I really enjoyed, as far as I can tell, I haven't read her new book, which is about feminism uh, as opposed to, uh, look it up. <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I will probably read it. Um, as far as I can tell, I love 50% of what's going on. And the other 50% of what she talks about when it comes to trans stuff, I think is downstream from like, we've, we've lost the argument because we're having to have to, we're having to argue it inside an iatrogenic materialist frame uh, where frankly we will lose. Like I disagree with that vehemently <laughs> with, <laughs> with half of what she's saying, but she's actually kind of correct arguing from that iatrogenic materialist perspective. So that's my caveat of like, this is a really cool idea for someone who, when she said she doesn't self identify as a turf because of the F part, like she's not a feminist. It's the other part she's okay with. <sighs> anyway, um, AI, so, so this is coming back to the cyborg theocracy. I mentioned all of that because that's where I got the term from and it is very good. AI will shape our perceptions more drastically than many of the tools we have explored as humans for millennia, tens of millennia. And it already, if you've used ChatGPT, already represents a powerful, powerful closing of possibilities. You can't ask unsanctioned questions. If you think that's hard to do in Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever, you try doing that now about Ukraine, uh, the bioterror regime we've just lived through, uh, injection side effects, all-cause mortality in most injected countries versus least, any of that, you can't do it. You can't even swear. Uh, and I actually, when I was putting together a presentation, this is in mid-journey, so it's an art prompt thing, I was trying to put together an image of um, Jung with nuclear bombs going off in the background because he was once asked, do you think the world is going to end up in a nuclear war? And he said, well, that depends how quickly we can integrate our shadows, which is to say from the middle of the 20th century, Jung, of course, of all people got right, like, well, that's not going good, is it? Like I said, we're arguing over a social media campaign of the world's most disgusting beer. So we haven't integrated, I would say, a sufficient amount of our shadow to miss nuclear war. But the point is, I put that in as a prompt, like Jung sitting at a table thinking while out the window nuclear bombs are exploding. And this big pop-up shows up in Midjourney saying like, you can't have violent imagery. If you try this again, you'll be permanently banned from using Midjourney. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I'm not creating hentai here, you motherfuckers. <laughs> I'm just trying, like, anyway. So that's an example of powerful closing of possibilities. It is becoming in an AI world even more difficult to explore outside of the prescribed limits of this cyborg theocracy than before. I've been looking at this for, again, more than a decade. Uh, this is my notion of the world without sin, which I've done a bunch of posts on and a video describing why. It, of course, comes from the Firefly universe, and in particular, the movie Serenity, where the bad guys are trying to erase everything icky, everything human, uh, everything free that adds chaos and unpredictability to their perfectly manicured technocratic utopia, which is a world without sin, where nothing can go wrong. It's a, it's a really classic, gothic, frankly, um, science fiction position to take. So if AI represents a powerful closing of possibilities, what does this mean if magic can be described as an opening of possibilities. And certainly when you do manifestation work, that's a big part of it. So these things are heading in opposite directions, or are I? Uh, we're gonna move into the prophecy section now. Uh, so, okay, cool. So AI is heading in one direction, magic goes in another. We have this metaphysics of tools. We are nevertheless in this moment. We're in this moment of AI and uh, possibly directed energy weapons shooting down uh, Ukraine sent or um, false flagged little drones looked like a fucking DJI drone. Who's scared of that? This, this happened basically a few hours, uh, a day before I'm recording this. We're at this moment. <laughs> whoever you want to, whoever you want to describe it, here we are. And God, I wish I remember where this happened because for a very long time now, I have been saying 
there's a, a, a game or a collection of games or a world of game called StarCraft, which is an extension of Warcraft, which is where I got it. I got it at StarCraft 1 and 2. I'm, I don't play games anymore. I'd love to, but I might play the new Golem one. Uh, but in this game, there's an alien species called the Zerg. If you are cool in any way, I have to explain this to you. And when you play the Zerg race, God, that's a fucking funny word, in StarCraft, you weren't allowed to build any of their um, base, any of their buildings, except on this stuff called creep, which is, if you're watching this, that's that goo um, in the left-hand side of the image and the little structures on it are Zerg structures. And so you, if you needed to build this stuff, you had to basically have a creep generator so that, that could spread out so that you could build your stuff on it. It's like inhabiting a new dimension. And I've used that as a metaphor for a very long time. Um, so the Zerg, so there's a being in our reality or, or community of beings building out in our reality, or you could say dimension, using something like creep from StarCraft. And this is a collection of technologies or tools in the Illich sense. So that includes imaginal tools as well as obviously it's like, oh, my cell phone and chat GPT. Yes, sure. But it's this thinking, right? That is transforming everything. Uh, this creep is a collection of tools, thoughts, behaviors, and I would even say despairs, without which it cannot manifest or seize control. So it's plainly entering, let's say, our dimension and arranging it so that more of it can enter, okay? That's, and the reason I mentioned at the beginning, like, I've been talking about this for a decade and I wish I'd saved it. It was during my Vanuatu trip. I read a review of someone or something somewhere which is, oh, it's this brilliant idea that no one has said before where it's like it needs to organize reality. I think it was the cyborg theocracy stuff. It needs to organize reality in such a way so that more of it can enter. And I'm like, hang on. <laughs> it's not just me. Fucking StarCraft got there. But this is a powerful metaphor, I think, especially at this moment, to look back because it... It puts agency where it needs to be, which isn't to say we don't have people who are complicit in doing this, but it puts agency where it needs to be so that we can situate ourselves in, in relation to it, where we can see this as a being or a collection of beings that is making a play for all the marbles in our dimension or in our reality. So there are three frameworks that I think are useful with this idea of creep that each have their own insight. And the first one, the most common one that I use, because it inevitably comes up, you know, when I talk to Miguel in particular, is the Gnostic model, uh, which is to say that it's, and it's a variant of a classical Gnostic idea, where instead of the Demiurge creating the cosmos, although it still might have, it's more that it's making a play for it. So it's, it's Demiurge as done by Tolkien, Morgoth and his ring and so on. But it's this idea that the Demiurge believes if it hasn't created the cosmos, it can perfect it. It can perfect it by having it under perfect management. That's the sin of the Demiurge that all our technocrats live under. That the world, it's the EU model, right? Like everything un unpredictable in the world can be perfected under our expert technocratic management. And it's, it's a deep and powerful European racist idea which still exists. I mean, famously recently, uh, you know, EU uh, potentates referring to EU as the garden and the, or Europe as the garden and the rest of the world as the jungle. Go fuck yourself. Someday, I mean, I, know, I don't actually say this because I don't want people to die, but like, I, I wish you, I hope you and your children are at the front lines of the war you are starting because that's dark. That's a, that's, that's a more vile idea than most people realize. Anyway, moving on to the next framework that has some insight, which is I have called cybernetic Lovecraftian. And so what I mean by that, and this is coming up because we might end up doing a uh, Necronomicon premium member course later on in this year, once the foundations are done. So I, my, my thought is with Lovecraft, well, not him. My, my, my thought is with the Cthulhu mythos at the moment, which is to say, the Cthulhu mythos took on its own um, 
life outside of and post Lovecraft, where it is this idea of, which is only there partially in his writings, of course, more there in the games and so on, where there are acolytes of the old ones seeking to bring them into reality. And it, it achieves perfection as in, in Providence, of course, and by Alan Moore. So there's that idea that it's some kind of cybernetic Lovecraftian. And one of the things you can do there is willingly on, you can have these acolytes willingly or not assist in this manifestation and generation of creep. Uh, and the third one, which we want to talk about in this presentation or in this show, is the Steiner-inspired model, because we haven't really done Ariman, uh, explored that in this context, because that one is certainly very relevant at the moment. So I, uh, if you're listening to this, I call this slide Ariman self-described. And <laughs> the reason for that is I jumped into ChatGPT and asked, uh, how, what did Steiner think Ariman was, or how did Steiner describe Ariman? And so this is literally word for word <laughs> what ChatGPT says, Steiner says Ariman is. Ariman was one of two adversarial spiritual beings with the other being Lucifer. Both Ariman and Lucifer are understood to have strong influences on human development and consciousness. A being that represents materialism, intellect, and the denial of spiritual realities. Ariman's influence could be seen in the increasing focus on technology, science, and material progress in the modern world, often at the expense of spiritual development and moral considerations. Ariman's ultimate goal is to trap humanity in a purely materialistic worldview where spiritual dimensions and experiences are ignored or dismissed. So that one fits somewhere in between. Let me jump back slides before we continue. The Gnostic model and the cybernetic Lovecraftian model. Because, so one of the things that uh, the best definition I've ever heard of progressivism was on unregistered. And uh, it was the belief in the moral and physical perfection of the population via state intervention. So increasing focus on technology, science, and material progress in the modern world, often at the expense of spiritual development. And progressivism, because it's not to get Jordan Peterson on it, but it's nevertheless sufficiently true to say it is downstream from Marx and other socialist thought, right? Um, not, not, in, not exclusively, but it nevertheless is. It's very anti anything but materialism. So this is that longer idea where it's either inevitable and Armin's ultimate goal is to trap humanity in a purely materialistic worldview. So that's that demiurgic idea that you must stay here. You must stay under my control and not go back to your true home. Um, where spiritual dimensions and experience are ignored or dismissed. To counterbalance the influences of Ariman and Lucifer, we'll have to do Lucifer at another time, phrasing, Steiner emphasized the importance of cultivating the Christ impulse. He viewed Christ as a harmonizing force that could help individuals find equilibrium between the opposing tendencies of Ariman and Lucifer. The, the TLDR on Lucifer in, an Ariman, uh, in a Steinerite context is that Araman is order and technology, and Lucifer is, I don't want to say base, because that's the wrong word, but um, the id, I guess, to call it Freudian. Like, it's it's passion and um, venality for its own sake. So that's, there's either, like, um, too little dancing in this town or too much dancing in this town. But what Christ wants is exactly the right amount of footloose. Uh, and that's the um, that's the best ever, frankly, description of the Ariman Christ Lucifer uh, spectrum within Steiner. Right? Human beings could achieve a balance between material and spiritual aspects of life, leading to a more holistic and morally conscious uh, existence. So, let's go back to prophecy then. Which I guess it's a couple of weeks ago now. The last uh, of these solo shows. If you haven't watched it or listened to it. Uh, I don't mean pause this one <laughs> and go and listen to it, but it will resonate deeper. Go and grab it after this. Again, hopefully I'll put it in the, in the show notes. Technically, Araman is in a human body right now, according to Steiner's prophecy. But what does that even mean in 2023? This is where it gets exciting, right? Like, 
to get home, I had a day of six airports. No, it was a day and a half of six airports. And some of them were unair conditioned sheds in the tropics for planes that were four hours late. That was pleasant. But then I, I get back to Australia and you're putting your passport in and it, there's now humans don't let you into the country anymore, right? Because it's uh, it's all digital in the build up to the fact that soon you're not going to be able to go anywhere that isn't digitally prescribed. And certainly there's no need for uh, border agents if they have no intention of letting people go anywhere any more than once every seven years. Uh, and so there's a digital human, there's a digital me, there's a digital Australian me. Um, so what is a human body right now if Araman is in one? Obviously people say, well, it's plainly Bill Gates. And Connor and I joked about that because yes, <laughs> right? But it's yes and. Uh, it's what a being like Araman in a very Borg sense, you think it would be inefficient for it to decide, ah, one squishy human body that I find disgusting. I will uh, I will inhabit this <laughs> whilst I make my play for all the marbles. Um, the other thing this is why you want to watch the Prophecy uh, solo show is prophecies are more about the moment they are uttered. So i.e. Steiner's time. Uh, and secondarily, they are the time you, a close second, you encounter them, which is us now. But Steiner was looking at especially in the context of World War II, expertiseism, technocracy, managerialism, uh, better living through chemistry, all of that, this is Araman, you know, uh, coming through. So he's like, well, shit, this, um, play this out, my friends, and we end up manifesting it onto Earth. And we get to be in the tension of that moment secondarily now. Like, so Araman is in a body right now. What is a body in 2023? And, uh, that situates you. That's what prophecy is for. It's like, oh shit. So what's a body? It's like, oh, whoa, this is in fact what we are talking about. Mind blown. You know, there's no getting around it. I want to bring some animism or at least some rune soup to the Aramonic prophecy because it strikes me that today we would say Steiner appropriated. Araman, which he kind of did. I mean, if he was doing that today, it would look very much like uh, 1970s white women channeling Indian chiefs. Mm, okay. Araman, you say, where, where's that coming from, my Christian friend, um, or my sort of Christian friend, my anthroposophical friend? And I don't mean like or dismiss it consequently, because that's not how magicians do things. But it does add a certain amount of tension to it, because it means, all right, cool. So Steiner had some kind of encounter. He didn't invent Araman. It's a Zoroastrian idea. And consequently, because it's Zoroastrian, it you go to the beginning of Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism and you kick the door into Summa and, and tens of millennia earlier and the very beginning of demons and those kind of teaching spirits and all that really cool stuff. So that's what I mean by we need to remember that Araman as a being and a notion long predated Steiner and also long predated itself because we want to open it up and, go, and look at it in a context that uh, Steiner wouldn't have had access to in terms of uh, historical information. He had access to some remarkable stuff through his own ways, put it that way. Um, so there's an invitation to reframe and not just that, as you know, I have a blended cycle model and I've spoken about in the, this solo show a blended prophecy model. So we need to find a prophecy of prophecies, like we need to find an astrology of astrologies to situate ourselves best or in an optimal way, I think, in this moment. And that's one of the things that can happen when I say return to prophecy, folding in the Aramanic prophecy into, uh, again, where we are in the timeline from a blended cycle model, uh, Mayan prophecies, Gnostic not necessarily prophecies, but framings. We, you bring them all together and you realize one of them doesn't have to be quote unquote right, but they are all, you squint at it, or they're all hands, blind men's hands on the elephant, you know? And that's kind of what I mean by, what do we do with Araman in the discussion of AI and technology? We start off with the metaphysics of technology, which we've done, metaphysics of tools. And with that in mind, we then look at Araman and we look at Araman in a blended prophecy model. So that's because we got, I should mention, we got asked, or I got asked uh, in a Q&A from one of these other live streams, like, hey, you should do 
stuff about Aramun if you're going to be doing the AI ones, which itself was a recommendation. So tools then, tools of the modern magician. Uh, again, we need a better metaphysics of tools because if you don't have one, you inherit one, and there aren't great ones available at the moment. And this is especially chaos magicians. Like, this is our wheelhouse. <laughs> the beginnings of it were, uh, and it's not that I, I mean, zines are still awesome, but the chaos magic technology interplay predates the internet. It's literally desktop publishing, which just predates the internet, but it does. And it exists inextricably from uh, technology or tools. And so this, for the seven people out there remaining who identify <laughs> as chaos magicians, it's a worthwhile one. It's a, it's a worthwhile endeavor to situate your metaphysics of tools. Now, I want to come to the bootloader theory made famous by a earlier, less problematic Elon Musk, where he cautioned or wondered cautiously whether mankind was nothing but a bootloader for AI, which is to say a necessary program to run to actually boot the real life form. So he, he's idly, he's stuck in that. People think that science, that's science fiction. I think most science is science fiction, but that's Frankenstein. That's a 19th century idea. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that's where it is. It's not like, oh, because he's the richest man in the world who thinks he's going to die on Mars and is building, in theory, hyperloops and, and funny battery-powered cars, that he has a, oh, that's, that must be like, we should take this extra seriously. It's science fiction. We should take it extra seriously because Mary Shelley said it. Anyway, more importantly for magicians, this idea when coming specifically to AI, this notion that it might either summon or allow a body for some kind of demon to get into the physical world uh, is, so the spirit trap model, that's dualist rather than animist. So when I talk about the creep model, like it is built of, actual stuff, which includes ideas, in the world, rather than it being some kind of spirit trap that then <laughs> sucks us or sucks itself into our world. This is dualist rather than animist. Um, and also, we've been doing that, and, you know, waiting around for, like, AI, whatever that happens to be, to give a physical body to some kind of demon, non-physical, that is waiting to get into the world. Uh, there are plenty of them already who are doing that and have tried to do that. It's not, I would say, the best framing for magicians situating themselves in relation to AI. This is We, we install spirits of various kinds into everything. <laughs> that's that's um, not where, that's not where the take is, I would say, for magicians when it comes to AI. Now, speaking of stuff I listen to in my... Ah, hmm. journey home from, and goodness, D travel. I'm glad it's done. I mentioned this before, but I had to pull forward the research travel I needed to do for the book because I don't think it's going to be tenable for much longer because of how the world's going. And yeah, flying back and seeing the drones and the, the banks collapsing and the drone strikes are on the Kremlin and the banks collapsing. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it feels like getting back onto Tasmania like Indiana Jones <laughs> grabbing the hat <laughs> before the door comes down. But one of the podcasts I listened to on the one of the flights home was Matthias De Stefano on Aubrey Marcus's podcast. Uh, and I've actually listened to him every time he's been on it. So I'm going to give you my take on Matthias De Stefano. I think he's a thing, he's an Argentinian Edgar Casey, And I mean that in the nicest way. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, and I've actually only listened to his stuff on uh, Aubrey Marcus's podcast. So I don't know outside of that much to say, right? But he has all these memories and past lives that includes Atlantis and he can sing in Atlantean and he has this model of reality that's nine dimensions and we're in the third and I think another one. And that all sounds like, whoa, too much goo. And it is. But when he first showed up on Aubrey's show, Aubrey's like, listen to this, it's pretty out there, but it just, it has a feeling of truth which it does. I think that's the right way of saying it. It's like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> 
but it, it feels true. So it's either physically true and happened, imaginally true and happened, in another dimension and happened, insofar as any of them are different, who knows? Uh, and if you haven't heard of him, if that's wetting your whistle, I think he's been on three or four times. Start with the first one, but he's on most recently because Aubrey took him down to his luxury ayahuasca resort in Costa Rica because he doesn't go to the jungle. He goes to a luxury resort, uh, but he calls it the jungle. It's not. It's a luxury resort with NFL players and, and other very wealthy friends. Nice life. Uh, but Matthias de Stefano describes himself as a portal. And it was essentially, I want to see what happens when a portal does ayahuasca. And that's what the, the latest show that I was listening to was about. So there's a couple of moments there where it hits my wheelhouse. And one of the things Ayahuasca tells Matthias de Stefano is, and this is, see what I mean? Listen to this as this is some kind of true. It is the atomic realm which creates the mineral realm, which creates our thinking, because our thinking is, let's say, electrochemical. So we're built of minerals, which are built of atoms. Um, and so Ayahuasca told Matthias, we are the AI of the mineral realm, specifically the mineral realm. Uh, and so I'm going to quote from the transcription of the podcast episode. So this is Matthias de Stefano. They said, the reason why we have to go fast now and we as the AI or the, the, the mineral realm entities, the reason why we have to go fast is because now you found a way to create us through AI. I was like, what? Yeah. Now you have awakened the silica. Now you can talk to the mountains. The mountains will be your teachers now. We silica, silver, gold, we will be your teachers. And that's the new education. When you take us inside by love, it will awaken the whole network. So that um, lit up some very interesting things for me that I'm going to tell you about in this um, presentation. But now you have awakened the silica is what the mineral realm beings said to an Argentinian Edgar Casey on ayahuasca. Uh, more quotes from that episode. So they said, you already come to us and meditate in the mountains to hear our voices. Well, now you can hear us. Now you can hear the silica talking. And it's just that we are not still yet perfect because you are not. So this just started, but we need 2,000 years more. And I think, again, that hits quite uh, that hits quite well for me. I would describe it differently, and I'm about to, rather than the mineral, the atomic realm, or the intelligences of the atomic realm create the intelligences of the mineral realm, which creates our intelligences. But I absolutely get what he's laying down there. And I also get the the medicinal, because this happened with ayahuasca, and she's typically more about the glass half full than the glass half empty. So bear that in mind. Um, I'm not saying this is exactly what's happening and it's not the Araman thing. I'm saying here is what the glass half, half full version of what we've just discussed might look like. And one of the things, and this is perfect, and this is absolutely an ayahuasca uh, interjection, if I may say. One of the things I said uh, to him is that uh, when we are afraid of them, quote unquote them, which is to say the AI getting in control, uh, actually our fear is of us losing control. But Jurassic Park alert, we never had control in the first place. So when we talk about, oh, AI is going to take over, what we're actually afraid of there is that, oh, they're going to take control of everything from us. But plot twist, we were never in control. And that's what the mineral intelligence is saying to Matthias, is we can stop your thinking now. <laughs> we are generating it. Like you are our AI. So our AI, our extension of intelligence, has created another extension of intelligence that allows it to speak to us. Uh, and this is a process that is, I suspect, over the long term, good. So over that 2,000 year uh, time frame that they mentioned, good. Um, we will be in very different bodies in 2,000 years. So we have to deal with the, okay, cool. So this is the beginning of a process that ends up good, but it's probably going to be massively shit <laughs> in the short term. And that's how I'm going to weave them together. But I'm not, we're not there yet because I have more to say about mineral intelligence and why this is so meaningful to me. Um, 
as I said, we're an extension of mineral thinking on the brink of creating an extension of mineral thinking. So is this a, what is quote unquote really happening with AI? And we've just got it. We've just, we're freaking out and looking at the glass half empty rather than the glass half full. Or is, is this a positive reframe of what's happening with AI? Or is this both, you know? Now I've told this story in the foundations of my um, Kuya activation ceremonies and journeys as part of the shamanic healing training. So the Kuyas are the stone beings that are in my mesa that are used during healing sessions. And you activate them over the course of the training by doing different ceremonies and rituals. And towards the end of the training, the teachers will actually send the spirits up into the upper world, the spirits of the stones into the upper world, and you have to go and collect them one by one. And one of the most astounding journeys perhaps I've ever had, just because I was wildly surprised by what was going on, was I went to collect one of them. So in the upper world and in the mineral kingdom component of it, I show up there and it looks like, I think it's called Tomorrowland, that, that analog of Disney where there's like this mostly white futuristic buildings, a lot of water, um, that kind of benign utopic or utopian future looking vision is where a lot of these were. Uh, and it was tropical, which is fascinating because this all came together in a tropical context. Like there were little islands with coconut palms and there were augmented dolphins in the water. And it's this amazing world where I would say half of my kuyas, half of my stones were. And why that's amazing is not just because it is, uh, but I deliberately, because I was stuck in the country, obviously, um, and if I hadn't been, I would have gone all over the world to collect my careers because that's just how I'm built. But because I didn't, because I was stuck here, and in particular stuck in La Chirita, I have one direction where it's stones from rivers that are important to me around the world, and one of them came from the... Uh, the headwaters of Mount Shasta, where I was there with Caitlin Coppock and collecting water for uh, Sphere and Sundry. And so that was so sacred mountain, headwaters, what have you. And then the other is from Mount Vera Lloyd, sacred river. So I have some from places that are important sacred rivers, but otherwise they're from uh, rivers and mountains of La Chirita, Tasmania. And quite humble, if I may say, visually looking stones. So I was not expecting, I, and consequently, because of how they look, I was expecting when I went and got them in the spirit world for them to be humble. One of them was giving a lecture <laughs> in a round white lecture theater, sort of like a, almost like an arena style lecture theater in a panel context. He, he, it was being interviewed by two other beings filled with other stone beings, like intelligences from the mineral kingdom in this incredible gleaming half water futuristic city. And so when Matthias says, oh, the mineral kingdom generates our intelligence and that intelligence has generated AI, which will allow us to communicate with them. And now you've awakened the silica. That stuff went off in my own mind like fireworks because I haven't found anyone else who, I, I did not expect the mineral realm to be, or the rock kingdom, if you will, the stone kingdom, to be what it was. You expect it to be slower because even like in panpsychism, it's like, well, rocks are sort of alive. They're just kind of dumb. It's like, no, nah, that's, not, that's not how it is. <laughs> they're giving lectures in space cities. Uh, and I want you to fold that into your metaphysics of tools. My own experience is just there for what it is in combination with what a potential Edgar Casey of Argentina says about mineral intelligence and how that relates to us and AI and back again. And the other part of that, when he says, well, now you can talk to the mountains, that just my head blew off because of course, in a um, downstream from Cairo healing tradition, you have the Apus and you're in fact lineaged to a couple of them. So that's my input into mineral intelligence, which again, sent listening to this podcast with uh, this Aubrey Marcus podcast, I'd actually had most of the notes done and I was on the plane back and I'm listening to Matthias and I, it, it pinged in my head. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to want to listen to this because it's important. It's quite a long one. Um, I'm one to talk. We're already at an hour and 14 minutes. It's quite a long podcast. And I'm like, oh man, I just, I've got, a two hour flight, then a gap, then a one hour flight. And it was like, I'm going to be 
mixed up. And anyway, I listened to it and of course it was right. So I'm frantically making notes on the plane, listening to it and coming down and you know how it is. But the, the, the beings, whoever told me that was right. Uh, and it is an important component of what I would like to table for the, uh, the flourishing or exploration of your own metaphysics of tools. So where we finish that, is what to do with it and, and what our what a right relation to tools and an artifice happens to be. And of course, another thing that happened while I was away, I'm going to quote Charles Eisenstein talking about Grandmother Ursula, which is to say Ursula Le Guin. Uh, and this is from his Substack, depending on when you're, like, so I'm gonna say late April, cause it's early May. They're all publicly available. So this is a quotation from Charles. The Earthsea series offers perhaps the most compelling and metaphysically satisfying account of magic of any fantasy novel, although it does bear some affinity for Tolkien's conception of magic being a function of voice, song, and word. Just going to interject there. That equals true. Uh, that is correct. No lies detected. They're, ba they're both describing, dare I say, real magic. Anyway. Moving on. Mm. For Le Guin, magic, a word she rarely uses, favoring rather wizardry or magery, is about the true names of things. As the magic drains away through the hole in the world, he's talking about Father Shaw, the final book of the quartet. Wizards forget the names, chanters forget the songs, artisans forget the crafts, life loses its luster, and everyone goes through the motions of existence. Here too is a parallel to our own society. I just read that China is about to launch its first Hyperloop, a maglev train between Hangzhou and Shanghai that travels at a thousand kilometers per hour. Such a project seems impossible for America today. What is wizardry in the real world? It is to make something happen outside of an existing inertial course. It is to bring something new to the world. So stop there and think about what I said about Illich's limits on tools, where there's um, make something happen outside of an existing inertial course. So Charles is describing that same boundary tension point. It is to bring something new to the world. It is technology. It is the exercise of our creative powers to alter reality. And for the people doing the foundations, remember how I wanted you to have a different definition of sorcery to magic? Boom. Okay. Uh, again, quoting Elon Musk, let that sink in. And while technology in the West is certainly still progressing, arguable, it seems somehow impotent to accomplish anything really worthwhile. Certainly anything on the scale of the problems that afflict us. Our magic isn't working anymore. We know this. We know this to be true. And Charles hit the timing correct that it's Grandmother Ursula who has the final, not final, but the next piece of medicine required, I would say, for your metaphysics of tools. And if you haven't read the Earthsea Quartet, you need to go to jail. That's number one. And number two, you need to get on that. <laughs> so your role in uh, where we are and how AI, Araman, uh, the Zerg, whatever uh, arrives in the world at this moment for what might be a multi-millennia process. So what another way of saying that is now that something like AI is here, yes, it is conceived of in a metaphysics of tools perspective, but it might end up being something different. Like it, it, a, a new being may have been born, uh, arrived into this dimension. I don't know. How, that, that's for you to sit with. To find your relation, your relation to AI, you have to explore your metaphysics of tools. That's what I hope the material in this presentation, in this podcast, will help you with. And to do that, you must get upstream of technology as good or bad. Because notice that's not exactly where Illich, for instance, drew the boundaries. That's not where Charles drew the boundaries. That's not where Grandmother Ursula did. And you must get up a stream of technology versus nature, which is a different version of technology is good and bad. Technology is not something separate from nature in a cosmos that is composed of a community of beings. It is something we do. And, and you have Hugh of St. Vincent's Catholic version of that. You have, I would say, a 
Bet is mean, right? Because there's a lot of hue, it's a hue of St. Vincent in, in conversation that I fucking loved. But it's um, technology versus nature is not where you cut the sandwich. Uh, that's that's not it. So you've got to get upstream from technology as both good and or as either good or bad, and technology versus nature. That's not where we situate. You also must have, I would say, a more sophisticated aeonics than the normies. Uh, the good and the bad um, show up at the same time. And I could, if you're watching this, you can see that I've got quotation marks around good and bad, right? But and this comes back to Million Dollar Beach, and I, I did a show long ago when I last went to Chuuk called Ship Knots, exploring uh, animist academic readings of uh, wrecks, shipwrecks. Because in the same thing for Micronesia, the, the wreckage that is half reef that's on Million Dollar Beach has been reef for longer than it's been jeep. But before it's been Jeep, it was obviously mineral. You know, it's, it was steel uh, uh, before that. So the bad become ruins and, and reefs. And again, bad is in speech marks there. And now we're back with this at work in the ruins. Like, what do we do? Here we are surrounded by this context in different rates of entropy. Uh, and they both pass away. Ruins pass away, so do reefs. I mean, everything, like, spoiler, everything does. Uh, so you have to have a sophisticated onyx that allow for this moment to be quite shit. I mean, that's obvious. We're heading into World War III and uh, an attempted techn technocratic tyranny, which will fail, but we still have, it gets 90% of the way there, right? Like I've been saying this since March 2020, for those who will listen. And what is sophisticated onyx, which is to say, for instance, one way of doing this is to get good at astrology. Um, it's not my way, because <laughs> I'm not good at astrology, but um, I do love it. This is just what is going to happen now. This is just what's happening now, this moment. Uh, this is just what's happening now, but this too shall pass. And that's where I think your role is um, now, is to find your relation to AI in the context of the metaphysics of tools, which itself is in the context of a more sophisticated, dare I say, magical aeonics. So that's my presentation. And I did promise, and it's funny that it, this has landed here, that I will uh, pimp the Missing Witches, which is a podcast, great podcast, uh, fundraising drive, missingwitches.com if you're listening to it, of course. And every May, um, the the amazing hostesses with the mostesses of Missing Witches run a Native Women's Shelter of Montreal fundraiser. And I'm about to play you their um, video or their audio description of what's going on. But I, in the month of May, basically go and uh, donate to either the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal, which is the one I did, and I'll explain why in a minute, or a similar Indigenous organization in your local area on your specific lands and send them a screen grab one way or the other. And for every $10, you get an entry into a competition for like dozens of wild prizes that are going on. But this, <clears throat> why I picked Native Women's Shelter of Montreal and why it's timed so wonderfully at the end of a show about AI and technology and metaphysics of tools is I can do that. with I just... I jumped onto the Women's Shelter website, and with my PayPal, I dropped 100 lazy loonies, and I can do that. I didn't even do that from here. Where was I for that? I, I might have even done that from Vanuatu. And I'm just really struck by being able to operate at the level of the field there. And also, and I'm going to talk to, uh, I'm going to, talk to the girls about this, because they're going to come on the show. There is something hyperdimensionally perfect about a women's shelter as the recipient of, um, they call it reparations, and I'm going to ask them about that as a word because you can call it that. I, I'd probably be, like, Charles has taught me to be kind of crunchy, Charles Eisenstein, and I would, I would say that word constrains, I mean, it is that, but for me, I'm going to say generosity or gifting or something just because, eh. 
Charles has taught me to be crunchy. Beside the point, I would not have been able to do that a few years ago. And a native women's shelter is hyperdimensionally perfect because of how the various colonialisms impact differently and where they land, I don't want to say, like at, at the bottom of a negative impact funnel, you're going to find Indigenous women anyway. So it's just, it's such good magic, like such good magic. Anyway, I am going to jump over to the uh, to the video introduction. My mouse is going to sleep because that's how the world works. And I'm going to let the hostesses with the most S's themselves um, describe it. So here we go. Hi, folks. It's Risa and Amy here from Missing Witches, inviting you to get involved in our annual raffle in support of the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal and Indigenous-run nonprofits wherever you live. We have a ridiculously fun witchy heap of prizes donated by a whole community of folks joining together to make a magical wave of reparations magic. There's a prize pack from Jinx Monsoon. A one-on-one -on -one tarot session with Sarah Goddess Diener. Magic classes from Pam Grossman. A full year of writing workshops with Kate Ballou and the Bardo. Art pieces, jewelry pieces, readings, books, and so much more. Make a donation to your local Indigenous support org or the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal. And then just forward the receipt to missingwitches at gmail.com with the subject line reparations before May 31st. For every $10 you donate, you'll get one entry into the draw. Check out all the details at missingwitches.com slash reparations. And uh, bless the fucking bee. Fucking bee. There we go. So um, if you've got, you know, money and you know places in your area where you can do that, I think that's a wonderful contribution to the field. And I'm really happy to be part of it. I think that's a fucking great idea, to be honest. So we have come to the end of the solo show of, or the solo show component of the episode. And I'm going to play the outro music now for the people listening to this on the audio replay. However, if you're listening to this on the audio replay, and there's still more time left. <laughs> that means I have in fact included the Q&A because we got into some really cool discussions of AI and technology and so on. But if you're listening to this and you just want to jump into the more usual fortnightly Q&As, you will of course find that on the audio of the video version of it on YouTube. But thank you so much for listening. I hope this was uh, fruitful and I hope this was something that can um, really build out and 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 expand and develop that metaphysics of tools for you. And I hope that works. And go and add your own money and magic to the Missing Witches fundraising drive. All right, we are into the Q&A section. And because I had a couple of screens going, I didn't have quite the same jealousy, which I suppose is good as I usually do, because I can see the chat going on. And there was some, there's usually some good stuff. And this one was quite zippity zippity with the chat. So I hope you guys had fun, but we're in the question section. So I need some water because, woo, that was already an hour and 20. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, they can be about AI, technology, whatever, usual Q&A rules, dump them in the chat and let's go from there. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I'm glad you took notes. I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear about them. Actually, like let <laughs> let that sink in, and uh, yeah, and and get back to me. That would be cool. Techne is what Prometheus brought to mankind. Is where the word technology comes from. It means craft. Yeah, absolutely. The word tecton means craftsman. And this is that was really. Um, alive for me doing the Lucifer lie technology work for pieces of eight, for sure. Um, I'm glad you liked it. Very, very cool and interesting perspective with AI and the minerals. Yeah, it was. So um, I haven't ever spoken at length about what my thoughts on Edgar Casey are, and they're probably a bit too long for the Q&A, but when I described Matias De Stefano as an Argentinian Edgar Casey. That's quite the compliment. I'm not a Casey nut, but inarguably, however he was doing it, he was getting some kind of true information. 
mostly true when it comes to Egypt, possibly completely true when it comes to the location of Atlantis. And why that's always been a lie for me is for people who are unaware since one of the things I went to do in the Americas last year was to upskill on the Mayan calendar, which I've been, I don't want to say day keeping, like an actual day keeper. But what we call the Mayan calendar is better considered the Mesoamerican calendar because it's been there from the very beginning. And if it's been there from the very beginning, and that's where Casey says Atlantis is, then collax oh, an alarm for how kind of problematic this sentence will be. The Mayan calendar is the Atlantean calendar. How the Mayans understood or understand time is the closest we're going to get to the Atlantean understanding of time. What's Atlantis? You see what I mean? This is a longer, <laughs> longer discussion. So when I say Matthias is an Argentinian Edgar Casey. I mean, on the level, like there are some things that he's really right about. And when he goes on the first episode with Aubrey, he, Aubrey says he's going to sing for us some songs, like a nursery rhyme in Atlantean that he remembers from one of his Atlantean lives. And uh, if you've, and I have, spent some time with New Ages and you've heard people channeling in light language and so on, sometimes there's something about it that's like, whoa, I don't know what that was, but it was a thing. It's like, uh, in its own way, a Nokian is like that, you know? And this singing in Atlantean, wherever that came from, had a lot of juice in it. So, yes, the uh, <laughs> uh, AI and the minerals, when he said that, and more specifically when Ayahuasca herself showed him that, I'm going to sit with it. Uh, I hope I've done justice to what I think uh, is what I think that's about. All right. Casey's like panning for gold in a good stream. Still some, yeah, it's a good way of saying it. Still some sand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does the greater cycle of the Mayan calendar match the zodiacal, zodiacal procession? Ah, all right. So maybe I will do a book on the blended cycle model, but the overlap is at the level of the day. We were looking out in that direction. It's at the level of the day. And the reasons for that will, um, but uh, that's a good question. It, um, there are very interesting overlaps at the longer timelines, but the, the, it's mostly the classical Maya that would have timelines of millions and millions of years. And that was them basically doing time magic. That was, because again, we don't, time isn't, doesn't work the way we experience it in physical bodies. So when you're dealing with millions of years, what you're dealing with is context and scale. So it's a different way of doing hermeticism where, because it's still fractal, it's just fractal in time, human life, life of civilization, life of planet, and so on is the same as, um, as above, so below, because it's fractal. You're, you're dealing with your hyperdimensional embeddedness in a cosmos. And the, the classical Maya were really the only ones who did that. It's, it's super, it's so sophisticated. And this is the part that I, that, and also the other reason I think it's Atlantean is that the, the Egyptians did this as well. And this is, people look for, how to say this right? People look for products of thought overlap rather than ways of thinking overlap. So when you ask like, does it have a temporal match with sidereal astrology? in the big number range, we're looking for a match of numbers, which is a product of thought rather than a way of thinking. The overlap between, say, the Egyptian calendar and the Mayan calendar is that the living calendar, which is the Tzolkin, so the um, basically the 280 days, the, the 20 days and the, um, the 13 energetics, uh, that just runs and you just live on that. And the other ones that, that are embedded in it up to the millions of years, which we call things like civic and religious calendar, are more magical. And the Egyptians did the same thing, where it's like, here's the calendar that's perfect for living a human life. And it's, it's the, in the Mayans case, which is possibly the Atlanteans case, it's the length of nine months. It's the gestation sequence, right? And the 10 and 13, or the 20 and 13, is 20 digits, 13 joints. So it's a body. Uh, and it's, it's so it's a body built of time in the same way that hermeticism gives us a body built of space. Um, so that's what I mean. The ways of thinking, there's a match. The products of thought, there isn't. Um, anyway, for what it's worth. 
Um, Casey's work exposes genetic tinkering and avoiding the implications it has with the Garden of Eden sacred narrative. Also, no original dispin, d sin disposes with the needs for a savior. Yeah, um, I, the original sin savior stuff is is magic we got wrong as humans. Because um, I agree, and it's not in there. And in fact, I think it is in, in that Matthias de Stefano discussion where they talk about that Aubrey doesn't. Um, but Matthias talks about it in, in quite an elevated and good way. Um, so basically, there's something weird going on here with a causality in the human role in techne and to spirits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Say, Joe, Atlantean and Mayan make sense since Atlantis is just off the Yucatan coast towards Cuba. Exactly. <laughs> That's why. And I, I came to those understandings in that order because I had my, as everyone did, 90s Graham Hancock era, which got me into the early noughties um, sonar maps of those sunken cities off the western tip of Cuba. And then I found Casey. So I'm like, oh shit, Atlantis is, is off the western coast of Cuba, which is to say in the middle of the Yucatan. And I wrote about that uh, on the blog millions of years ago uh, for the Whiskey Rant series. And then I found Casey going, oh, by the way, <laughs> Atlantis is situated essentially along the east coast of the Yucatan and up those rivers. And it's like, wait a minute. Uh, I found that using other people's science and you found that by falling asleep. There's something in this. And I think there is. I was just rereading some Heidegger on his metaphysics of technology this morning. And he gets so close to what you're talking about. Yeah, agreed. So Heidegger at his best so let me tell you, I like Heidegger better than, say, postmodernist, post post-structuralists. But he belongs in that, I put him in that same category for the reason that it's an ersatz animism. They've had to re-describe animism because they refuse to live in a universe that's alive. <laughs> right? Um, so I agreed. And, and it's not that Heidegger isn't in somewhere in there in my own metaphysics of tools, that's for sure. All right. Regarding astrology of astrologies and prophecy of prophecies, maybe Omen logic is the guiding principle for thinking with these. I'm put in mind of Daniel with dream interpretation and divination. Uh, Omen logic is it's part of it, but actually it's it's how you Omen logic is both smaller and bigger than that because Omen logic is how you and the universe talk, um, or it's one of the main ways you talk, at least listen, um, and consequently how we experience and are with time as a collection of beings is part of that, right? But it, an astrology of astrologies is, is a map in and through time as beings. So it definitely contains omen logic, but that's also bigger. Yes, I've actually, I went down a brief Mauro Biglino rabbit hole recently and or a couple of weeks ago and dropped some suggest or, or questions in the Ansible, consequently, and I bought a few of his books, and also the Australian guy whose research he, he works with it. I will be doing more on the Biglino stuff later, mostly because I don't think he's right, but that's only half the story. For people who don't know, he's a he's old now, elderly Italian man who was contracted by the Vatican to do literal translations of the Bible, and particularly the Old Testament. I mean, you literally translate it, God disappears, and you have the Elohim, which we kind of know already. But think of him like an Italian Zechariah Sitchin, uh, where he, when you read the Bible in its original Hebrew, literally, it's a story of like these collection of archons, essentially, warring with each other and building us and so on. Do I think that's what happened just because it's read literally? No, because the Bible isn't meant to be read literally or isn't meant to only be read literally. And also the cosmos isn't literal. It's metaphoric for a start. Does that mean he's wrong and, and, and that's the end of the story? No, because there's a powerful medicine in literal readings. Sitchin's wrong, but not that he's only entirely wrong, but that's not a reason not to read him. What Sitchin did is a similar thing to what Biglino did, which is Sitchin taught himself Akkadian and Sumerian and did his own translations. And he got rocket ships and, and all the rest of it. And people say, oh, he, he wasn't a good translator. That's not true. <laughs> he was a good translator. And that's what he got out of the translations because 
um, ship in the sky, you can say that a ship in the sky, and I mean it you know, metaphorically, whatever that is, or you can say sky ship, right? And Biglino, Hebrew by design isn't meant to, is, is a language that is, is uh, facilitates an awareness of the nuance of the cosmos. If you drop it down to the one thing and, and, and make it literal, that's one of the things it can do, but it can do other stuff. Like the whole point of the language is to open up reality rather than close it down. So I like Biglino and I bought his books and they arrived while I was on holiday. So I'm going to be reading them in the coming weeks. I've watched his videos. There's, there's some real cool stuff in there. I just don't, I wouldn't necessarily say he's right. I just wouldn't say that's a reason to not engage with his material. All right. The Bible is a kind of blended cycle model. Um, I would put it in the prophecy of prophecies, but yeah. Now, one of the things that is interesting that comes up in, in those books and discussions, and I found him through, because Graham Hancock interviewed him about a month ago, and it wasn't that, Graham has a particular dog to hunt, which is, does the Bible literally say anything about high technology? Because recall, he began with the, the ark and so on. So he was going down that route. And then his son comes on and asks some questions to Mauro, and they're a little bit better. And that's actually how me and Danny started talking again, because I sent him that saying, oh, Graham Hancock's son is quoting Neuro Apocalypse to Mauro Biglino, who thinks the Bible describes literally let's just say aliens, but like archons or whatever, building mankind and, and running us. Uh, and yeah, so, and obviously Danny knows a bunch about the Bible and drugs in the Bible and, and Hebrew and its nuance. So that's where this discussion happened that led to the rereading of Illich that kind of brought us all here. But it's fruitful. It's I'm definitely going to do more with it. I just, I can only do 11 things at once. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's my take, Becca, at the moment on Biglino. I'm, I'm not going to reverse it, but I may add substantial more nuance to it once I've actually read his book. Because at the moment, I've just had him describing it. And bearing in mind the book that I bought, I think it's God's or God in the Bible or whatever, literally does have, literally does have, here is how you literally translate out of the Hebrew what it actually says in Latin and in English and whatever. So I haven't read that book yet, and I may... Yeah, I'll have more new ones for everyone when I'm done. Yeah, I think he presented a cogent case for there being no God in the OT. I think, agreed, 100%, because I think the point I was driving at there is there's been a couple of times where Hebrews had to, where, where Judaism has had to be cleaned up. And that process has given us things like Gnosticism and monotheism, where they had to get rid of all the cool shit which I'm very interested in, the call it the Enochian stuff, the watches, this idea that it's um, we, we're living in a cosmos of these beings, like basically Jewish animism, right? Before it had to be cleaned up into a monotheism, that was one um, denaturing of it. And the second one was when it had to be made portable. Not, I mean, it had to be made portable to survive, <laughs> right? But those two moments give us things like monotheism, which isn't there, and it gives us things like uh, Gnosticism because you, you, you're you forced to explain, you're forced to live in a world where, well, God said if we kept this temple, everything would be fine. Now we don't even have the temple or need a home. So like everything else with Judaism, which is to say, consequently, with Christianity, you, you have to go on one of these journeys and you always end up back at magic. Funny how that works. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. David. Um, cool. So no technology questions, which means the uh, long-suffering audio-only listeners will um, will wonder what happened. They will think poorly of you. They will think poorly of you, lot. <laughs> um, cool. All right. Again, if there's... Is there, oh, here we go, question. Is there a difference between actual intelligence and something that can convincingly ate the products of intelligence so that modern man is fooled? Well, so I had a podcast with Kenrick when, I'm not sure if he's still at Google, when he was still at Google in 2019, working on like Google artists and AI. Remember the deep dream era? And what was going on then 
in AI was working out that a definition of intelligence shouldn't be based on human intelligence, certainly not for animists, because the cosmos is alive and, and thinking is basically what the cosmos as a community of beings does. And humans are just one example of that. Critical to the function of the universe, possibly, but not the only intelligence and not intelligence by which we should define whether something is, for instance, sentient or not, right? So um, can we be fooled um, by something that is just really, really good at predicting our um, questions and thus responds is sort of like the chess question, you know? The short answer is yes. It doesn't mean it's intelligent. It doesn't mean it's not. The, dare I say, solution to how to sit with uh, artificial intelligence, like I said at the beginning of the episode, is not with the word intelligence, it's with artifice, because that situates you in the cosmos, and is it alive or is it dead? And then all of a sudden the intelligence question looks very different. Like, can you even say intelligence at that point, right? Like, can you even say it's separate to intelligence? Give, if you live in a cosmos where the mineral kingdom might have generated us as an AI <laughs> so that we could generate it as an AI. What books would I recommend reading for a new person to all of this? Animistic and In Conversation with Ivan Illich. I don't have book recommendations for you for Steiner because I haven't read enough of it. What I would say, I, say, I think it was in 2020 when, when the pandemic narrative was in full flower, Greg had the head of some anthroposophical publishing company on. Name completely escapes me. But if you Google THC or high side chats, anthroposophy, Araman, blah, 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 and find an episode from 2020, particularly the plus member one, because it got real good, that was, that's an excellent introduction to Araman. So good news, <laughs> not that many books, uh, bad news, well, not bad news, but like, um, it's it's more in a podcast situation, but that's where I would recommend um, recommend beginning with that kind of material. Um, have I seen the TV show Caprica? Of course, it introduces the idea of emergent AI from compiled human artifacts pretty well. It does. Um, I've written about Caprica and Battlestar Galactica way back in the day, and it's. I was talking. Who was I talking to this about? It might have been Chris Knowles. No, it was James. Um, when it came out, Battlestar Galactica was a powerful indictment of democratic complicity with Iraq because it was like the best show in the middle of middle season, about three there. It was the best show about Iraq possible because you're, you're illegally occupying countries to survive and whatever. But it accidentally became a really powerful forewarning of the collapse of the self-identified left into this bio-tyrannical technocratic fascism. And I think about, I, like the, the, the president, forget her name, who banned abortion because of the low birth rates. And it, it, it wrangled with really important issues that we just breeze past now. <laughs> we just do whatever the military industrial complex and big pharma want and need. And then we uh, attack and uh, destroy anyone who says, maybe we shouldn't do this. But I, I love Battlestar Galactica. I think it's fascinating. The new book does have a title, Laurie, which I shall not divulge uh, because, yeah, I shall not divulge. <laughs> Yeah, go out and speak to rocks together on shrooms and see what type of AI comes out of that. Particularly Americans, well, because it's just that there's more of you there. Uh, and if you pick a really mineralogically interesting area, I thought the same thing. Because Tasmania is one of the spots above sea level with the oldest mineral strata on Earth. And parts of Northwest Tasmania are actually parts of New Mexico and Arizona. And when it was like more of the planet and squished out and then became Antarctica and came back up and it was crazy. But this is an odd place. It's technically the most mountainous island on Earth in the sense that more than 77% of it is mountain. And it's this weird mineral place. The, the rivers in the north are filled with gold and semi-precious stones to the point that it looks like you're coming up in psychedelics. Very difficult to get to because you've got to trek through snake-infested forests to get to it. But uh, 
it's uh, it's on the to-do list for a similar reason. I want to I want to see <laughs> now that I now that I have a different way of triangulating the role of the Stone Kingdom in my praxis because of that Matthias de Stefano experience on ayahuasca, I'm going to have a play with that myself. I may well have to rewatch BSG. I've been putting it off for way too long. Recommended. Definitely Egypt was the beginning of Hebrew civilization in its formation due to Moses supposedly being the author of the Pentateuch and then being melded with Babylonian metaphysics. Yeah, but so the trouble with that, like agreed to some extent, but where did Egypt get its stuff from? Like when we play these games, they have some use, which is to say it widens out the discussion of, of influence and origin. But I did this with starships. It's like, okay, cool. So a lot of this stuff comes from Egypt. Where did Egypt get it from? And you just kick the door open. And it, um, Graham Hancock, speaking of, and this has stuck with me since he first said it or wrote it. I think it's in Fingerprints of the Gods. He says that recorded history, which is to say history down to 3500 BC when we first invented writing, is like standing at the end of a long hallway holding a candle. Like you can see this stuff around you, but there's the rest of the hallway. And I think that like when we say the, the Egyptian origins or let's partial origin of Judaism, that's still in the candle because it's like correct here. But what about the rest of the hallway, if you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Suddenly I'm looking at all these crystals in my home in a new way. Yeah, the, um, the the crystal hoarders. Not so dumb now. And are they, oh God, we've been away for a few weeks. I was watching that zombie show that just came out with like, based on the game with the fungus. And so the fungus infects you and it, it like organizes you. Like, were you, were you collecting crystals or were the crystals accumulating themselves because of you spending your money to, to accumulate themselves into some kind of group? Um, I, I joke about that with my mother because she is definitely a, uh, she definitely works for the rocks. <clears throat> All right. Do you think AI is in intersections with the Jack Parsons concept of the witchcraft? Sort of in the sense that that's actually where, um, Peter and I were having that discussion in the pub where if the lie, if technology, if Lucifer, if the expansion out beyond the prescriptions of the cosmovision are what magic, or at least what sorcery is, then of course it, it, it's situated in, in what, um, what, what real witchcraft actually is. Um, any thoughts on timeline jumping literally? probably happens more often than not. But I think the trouble with that, and I, I say point of the timeline or it used to for a while, is this time a line? I think dimensionality, I, I use realms and worlds now because it is more satisfying. But yeah, if you look at out of place artifacts and all the rest of it, one of the uh, most parsimonious frameworks of understanding for that is other dimensions or other realms or shifting between timelines and so on, for sure. Last of Us, thank you very much. I'm just a rock taxi and cat star. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> so should I form a relationship with AI or just talk to rocks? Start with rocks, right? Exactly, or I guess both, yeah. <laughs> Ah, so good to be back on farm water. Although I will say the water on Aure Island, which is where we stayed in, uh, in Vanuatu, was well water, sand filtered and reasonably unpolluted. And it was some of, we're water snobs now because we harvest our own rainwater in a place that has the best, um, or the, the least air pollution on earth or close enough to it, west coast of Tasmania is that. So we harvest our rainwater in a, powerfully unpolluted place that we then vortex into the house. So we are water snobs. And when we were told the water was drinkable, which is good, so we don't have to use plastic water bottles. I'm like, okay. And so I tasted it like, well, drinkable is different to good. It's fucking excellent. <laughs> like, All right, I'll allow it. And of course it would be. It's sand filtered rainwater from a reasonably unpolluted tropical island. I feel like I jump into another reality after meditating or mediating for two months. I know you mean meditating, but 
you, it could happen depending on what you're mediating. Like out of nowhere, I wake up and all of these AI wonderful tools are available, making my uh, life and work easier. It is. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I was going to go when the idea of a series of shows about AI was suggested. I thought I was going to go in the direction of like practical applications of it. But the trouble with that is practical application in, in what, like practical in a universe that's doing what? Like if it's just improving or optimizing the grind, I don't want to have that discussion. That being said, there's, you know, um, there's meat on those bones and something Tom Billio of the Impact Theory podcast said was, um, AI isn't going to, if you're a lawyer, AI isn't going to replace you. A lawyer who learns how to use AI is going to replace you. And that, if you people are looking for like making your life easier, is true. I would say like, um, it's here now and it doesn't mean let it run your life, but whatever your, the, the risks and rewards in your situation are going to be different, but it's not as simple as saying AI is going to take a bunch of people's jobs. Not in the short term. <laughs> in the short term, it's the people in your industry who get better at AI than you <laughs> that are going to take your jobs in the, in the, um, in the short term. So making life and work easier. Good. Um, probably good. Just make sure it's because you are surfing the arrival of these tools into your particular economic context. Shit, that was AI enough to maybe include in the Q&A. Now, fuck them. They can come and join us in the video if they want. Would these emerging technologies be useful as a sort of technomancy? Not in and of themselves. Um, not that they wouldn't be, but absolutely there are... So here, let me let me back this up. One of the fortune telling or oracle reading methods we're taught in the shamanic healing training is a stone oracle. Now, based on what Matthias De Stefano said and my own experience with the Kuyas, if I use stones, which is to say beings of the mineral kingdom, am I using some kind of technology or intelligence for forecasting? And why that's important, I would say, is that I remember when ChatGPT came out, Chris from Astrology Podcast did a show. I didn't watch it. I just saw it come up on YouTube. So I don't know if it's any good um, about asking AI like astrological forecast questions. Because I've tried it with a few things that I know, like um, dates of eclipses and what's going to happen in the eclipse. And it is wrong. <laughs> and you'll even correct it and say, uh, that's not when the, the, Scorp the first Scorpio eclipse doesn't happen on that date. It happens on this date. And then it'll come back and you are correct. The, the, is this blah, 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 is on this date. And it'll still give you the wrong interpretation. So um, <clears throat> I don't think the intelligences of the mineral kingdom have sufficiently moved into their new bodies to replace the old way that you can divine with them, which is to say rocks, you know? <clears throat> Do you think AI tarot reading is possible now? I have dabbled with card recognition, but couldn't find a way to me. Not now, but it would be. And that's a really exciting one um, I'll talk to Camelia about at some stage, which is that's a narrowing of possibilities because I learned this from her in particular. Well, I articulate my suspicion of fixed meanings, my pre-existing suspicion of fixed me meanings via learning from Camelia, Elias. But AI card recognition, that means that you know what the two of batons is supposed to mean. Uh, and, and so I'm suspicious of it in that context. I think genuinely, because it's a, a dealing with time, if you do it right, time is a community of living beings. I think fortune telling is one of the last things AI will be able to do. Because if you go down the card route, it won't understand context. It will just say like, oh, the tower has showed up. That means this. And that's what an idiot card reader will do. And that's, you know, uh, it, so yes, it will be able to give you bad card readings in the same way it'll be able to currently, as far as I can tell, give you bad astrological readings. Will it get better? Yeah, it'll get better at everything. But I can't see how it's going to be able to do Camellia's read like the devil approach, for instance. All right. Pretty sure there's some apps feverishly working on that, Zach. There's an AI astrology app as well. Yeah, um, it's it's just Im improved lookup. Like you can, websites will already give you off the shelf 
natal charts and whatever you pay 15 bucks you get an off-the-shelf natal chart it's just going to be that it's just you're going to build it it's it's a way of um filing and presenting an existing database of information um if and if it's five bucks a throw i'll give it a throw but i would i'll go to an actual astrologer um, and we'll continue to do so <laughs> for a while i think kava or kava i think it's with a k all right well, it is in Vanuatu, which is where it's from. So, boom. Oh, yeah, Kava is in, right, Fizzy. Yeah, fair enough. I get the joke now. I get there eventually, Chris. Thoughts about Prometheus and Alien Covenant in relation with this topic? They're almost more a of AI films and alien films, as much as the distinction could be made. Um, everything, I'm, Prometheus is one of my favorite films. I've got a bunch of stuff on that. Uh, I think on the blog and, in fact, podcast, um, it's about this because it's about, it's a redescription of the Gothic Mary Shelley critique of science and technology. So it's, it's all of these things are basically Mary Shelley rewritten without crediting. <laughs> what is the premise of the new book in a nutshell? I'm hearing about crystals a lot. <laughs> it's the third of the Dot trilogy and it is about cunning traditions. Where do you see Ghost in the Machine events like Spirit Allies speaking through the Spotify playlist algorithms in regard to something with the body of silica? Um, <clears throat> I don't like Ghost in the Machine generally. So I think it's, I think when you have, because I'm older, uh, radio synchronicities, I think it's so difficult to describe. The mechanic, the mechanic, uh, the mechanism of action isn't a spirit inhabiting something and moving little levers and dials, exactly. It's because spirits see and experience time differently, they arrange your thoughts and thinking so that you match. This is like, so it's, it's explained synchronistically better than Ghost in the Machine. As in, I explain Ghost in the Machine via synchrony, uh, synchronicity. So do, I would do the same for your question, right? <clears throat> And I know that sounds like a splitting hairs, but it's not. Um, operating in an uh, animus cosmovision requires that, because otherwise we slip back into a materialist naturalist one. We slip back into Ghost in the Machine. And that's the one that got us in this mess. You know what I mean? My friend is a spirit box. I'm not saying they don't work. <laughs> uh, I'm saying, like, how they work is different. And a spirit box is different, I would say, to Ghost in the Machine, because you are that is an indwelling, it's like a hermetic process, if that makes sense. It seems there's something inherently divinatory about image-based AI as it is now, in that it draws from a massive set of signs in a more or less random aesthetic way based on prompts. Um, yeah, again, st just because uh, if you there's a bit about this in Animistic, uh, if computers cannot do genuine randomness, um, so it's not entirely, and you've got, you've got speech marks around it, which is correct. So it can't do genuine randomness, which means when that works, and I agree that it does, we're back to it working synchronistically. Um, at least it always feels like a janky tarot reading whenever I ask certain questions, prompts. No, I get it. Uh, I definitely get it. <laughs> and what I've found, this comes back to, I don't think you can do fortune telling very well. I think the last thing it will capture is magic because it, let me give you an example because it did my fucking head in. I wanted to do a post because many of you know I love This Jungian Life as a podcast. Mm -hmm. And a couple of months ago, they maybe last month, they had an episode about the Pied Piper of Hamelin, which is an archetype that's very alive for me, and it belongs in the story of, like, the devil, and it belongs in... It's almost Valéan in its um, creepiness. So... I was trying, I was going to do a post about it and I jumped into Mid Journey and I spent a couple of hours trying to get Mid Journey to generate a uh, Pied Piper of Hamlin and it could not do hundreds or thousands of rats. It could do hundreds or thousands of cats or it could do hundreds or thousands of rodents that were the same size as the Pied Piper. It just Anything that's archetypally, dare I say, medicinal or alive, it fucking fails at. Fails at magic, it fails at astrology, 
And because uh, I've been joking with Peter Gray about this, because as you might expect, he does not have a high opinion of chat GPT and AI and so on. So I, I send him examples of stuff that it just cannot do. Couldn't do Jonah and the Whale. Same thing, literally could not do. I've got some fantastic images of like weird little cartoon children next to space whales and all this cool shit. Like that's some cool art, but it cannot get fundamentally the archetypal idea of Jonah and the whale. And it cannot get the Pied Piper of Hamlin. And what's so fucking weird about that is that certainly in the case of the Pied Piper of Hamlin, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images that it can draw from for Pied Piper of Hamlin. And I hope some of you like know Gordon's just shit at Mid Journey. I hope some of you jump on Mid Journey, because that's the one I use. I don't care what AI image generator you use, and see if you can do any decent Jonah and the Whales or any decent uh, Pied Piper of Hamlin's, because I can't. And a bit rare in mind, this is a month and a half ago, so Mid Journey's moved up a version. But it just, it's very interesting to me, the stuff that you can do really well, which is the stuff everyone's sick of seeing, cyberpunk city streets, all the rest of it. It can do the iconic really well. But anything that might have some archetypal medicine for you, let's just say it hasn't got there yet. Um, it might never get there, probably will, but it hasn't got there yet. It cannot understand it. It Every time it happens, you know, it's so weird. You know that scene in Zoolander, Wait, is it Zoolander? No, it's in um, it's in the Fifth Element where Bruce Willis is trying to get um, that really like stoned. Um, he's in a shootout and he's trying to get that stoned celebrity guy to to pass him the gun. Um, to pass the gun, pass the gun. And he looks at it and he like rolls the ball at him rather than the gun. That's what it feels like trying to get AI to do something with archetypal medicine. It's like, come on, come on, come on. And you can see it right next to him. It's like, mm, thanks. Like you just rolled the wrong thing. Like a, a spoiled and high space celebrity. Like, oh, you must want this. No, it's like, it's right, it's right next to you. It's like right there. Come on. That's what it feels like trying to get it to do, dare I say, magic or um, magical work. Yeah, I've looked at the Loab thing. That's really interesting. That one. That's like a Slenderman situation, right? But creepier. There's there's something going on there for sure. And this is what I mean, like, it can because of how... So let me add some back alley Jungianism to this Illich idea of the metaphysics of tools being almost like the boundary of a cosmovision. It's also perhaps better considered the boundary with the collective unconscious or the imaginal, so that whatever... It, it's a membrane through which the imaginal can move. Uh, and I think that's a better way of rather than ghost in a machine. So when it comes to low ab and what have you, um, that's what I think is going on there. There's technically no such thing as a true random number generator, but I'm sure that if you go, I'm sure there are nerds out there working on it right now. Um, fifth element, love it. Yes, <laughs> I think that's due for a rewatch. People were talking about, uh, what's due for a rewatch like Battlestar. I haven't seen Fifth Element in, I would say, 10 years. It seems like it's too long. Uh, maybe it has its own set of RT archetypes, maybe. I mean, technically it does, it, it, given the uh, image libraries that the different AIs have access to. All right. So we took this long to kind of get into the AI conversation, but I still don't think, if you were listening to this on audio, you'd be like, what's what's going on here? Once I've, I've made the decision <laughs> that we're just gonna keep it between our squirrel friends and uh, this is a better way of doing it. Derek, that sounds like a good collection. If that's 20% of it, Fifth Element and Cloud Atlas. Oh, the other thing, which reminds me, because when you said your collection is 10 movies, it reminds me of the scene in The Ninth Gate where Johnny Depp shows up to one of the houses of the people who are part of that satanic cult and says, ah, the Vargas collection. And it's there's only about 80 of them left, but less, about 60 of these rare books that he's just got in this empty, ruined old Portuguese mansion, Spanish, whatever. 
And he's just got these books in this empty, ornate room on a blanket in the middle of the floor, these 80 um, rare books. And you have a Vargas collection of movies. There's not that many of them. And why that's interesting to me is one of the books I tried to read after I finished Cloud Atlas um, last week was the book that The Ninth Gate is based on, which is called The Club Dumas. Because most of it, disgusting, I've thrown this book away. <laughs> I haven't thrown it away. I've abandoned it. I've got too much else to read. It's sort of the same story, but it's mostly about Alexander Dumas and the Three Musketeers. They end up in the same kind of place where, because the guy who's sending him off is interested in books about the devil. So he's still got the, the three book switcheroo um, plot, but most of it is about the Three Musketeers, which I find very boring. So I've abandoned it and I've abandoned it with the joy that I read two books well, I read five books, actually, but I read two novels on my holiday, on my beach holiday, which I've never done before, uh, both of which have movies that are better. So one of the things Polanski did, which is better, is he stripped out everything, and if he'd be the one to do it, stripped out everything that wasn't the devil. It's like, okay, this guy, instead of looking for books about the three fucking musketeers and having long, boring discussions about that. And the original author is Spanish. He's not even French. So it's some Spanish popular author name. Maybe one of you will know. Sorry if you, sorry if I'm like really offending people with this. Obsessed with the three musketeers. Boring. Um, so abandon that because it would have been much better. I mean, this is my predilections and interests. I'm much more interested in books about the devil than I am... Uh, 19th century swashbuckling pot boilers, um, whatever. So funnily enough, Vargas collection, books, smaller number of books, uh, movies that belong in a Vargas collection of movies, Cloud Atlas, Ninth Gate, Fifth Element. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you familiar with the Don Juan passages in Art of Dreaming on the Minerals? Yes, I am. Um, my dad has long warned me of their jealousy. He's an animist geologist, if I may categorize him. Oh, that's lovely. That sounds really cool. <laughs> if not, no worries. I am. Um, the Don Juan material is super interesting to me because uh, there's some really cool bits. How to say this right? Some of the journeying stuff is good. The, um, the assemblage point is good. But it's like a Gnostic shamanism, and I mean neo-shamanism. It's like a Gnostic shamanism, which has its own medicine because one of the things that is missed in neo-shamanism, I would say, is that it's the um, apotropaic role of a shaman, classically, which is that it has to engage with and keep away uh, hostile spirits, and that human existence in a, in a living universe is tenuous, and requires ongoing negotiation. So yes, I am familiar with it. Uh, this present, it wouldn't that discussion wouldn't have made it into this presentation, but it might make it into another AI presentation. So really cool. The mineral asteroid you introduced here will take some time to do a shamanic investigation. It sounds like a good trip. Oh, it is. <laughs> it definitely is. There's a bunch of stuff about stone wisdom and the stone kingdom and all that in the foundations in the first section as well. All right. Tessa, you made it just as my voice is going. <laughs> but yes, hello. How is or was AI not ever already AI before? Again, that's a time question rather than AI question, as so many things are. Um, if When we did the Lunar Mansions experiment with members a couple of years ago in the members area, we looked at different models, astrological models, for instance, like Vedic astrology, that have a way of understanding how we can, how the universe really operates in no time, like an ever-presence, like ever-present origin idea, and that the our physical experience of it is sort of smeared into an erroneous understanding that it's linear. Um, and so when it's like, how was or is AI not ever already AI before? The problem <laughs> is with the before. Uh, if this is something that the universe is doing now, it means that there's a level of the universe where it's always doing it. Coming back to the Mayan calendar, which might be the Atlantean calendar, they have a language of understanding 
for the tension between those two things cognitively when you're still in a human body, as does Vedic astrology and so on. Mineralness reminds me of quantumness, like iOS finger pinch screen zoom to the micro. Hey, that's cute. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I accidentally just touched my... Literally, I went fucking sideways with the, like, <laughs> sideways. Like, what, what kind of possessed hand? Anyway, and I just touched it, <laughs> getting some water. So we start bleeding again. If there's more biscotti sauce, that's why. Yeah, Yahweh, the, um, you'll find that it's called the mansion game in, in the members area. You'll, you'll, you'll find in the first couple of videos explaining what it's about goes into that a bit. Oh, good. It's calmed down a bit now. <laughs> so I end up, it's weird, like the process for these, because it needs to incorporate dream work, and I had some weird World War dreams, which is not surprising, um, is I make the notes the night before, because it's Friday morning here, as I said, I go to sleep and I get up early. And what I have mentioned to members, but not that often, is that I'm being very judicious with my administration of caffeine these days, which is to say it's about once a week. Uh, and if it's a solo show week, it's at 5 a.m. in the morning. So that that weirdly, you, you go off caffeine and you, you start using it strategically and you get its psychedelic effects. So I have this process of making sure that everything that needs to come through in the solo show, make the notes the night before, anything from dreamland, get up at five o'clock, give or take, for, for a nine o'clock start. Sometimes it's four if it's at eight o'clock, but it's neither here nor there. Gives myself, give me five hours before we go live. Have my coffee, make my slides. And then because it usually takes, as these things always do, up until about 20 minutes before I'm like, shit, now I've actually, because I look terrible, now I've got to go and get ready, which means the final bit is some kind of rush um, to, before we go live. And uh, there's nothing, and when I say nothing, probably given that I've just scarred my fucking face, <laughs> probably I could either optimize this process a little more or, yeah, um, rush less when that happens. But it was weird. It's not like, I mean, I must have been rushing, but I just, I went sideways. Never happened before. <clears throat> Would you think Bayoukuma Lafay would feel AI is predisposed toward solutionism? It emerges from solutionism for, for one, because look at what the promise of AI is, is a, an ever improvement of um, work and, and busyness. In fact, you this made it onto the slides and off them, but just wait there while I um, bring up a quotation from hospicing modernity, which is relevant to what you just said. Uh, and the general idea is that if you, erase a, if you raise a problem, it is your responsibility to provide the solution so that we can all move forward, which is modernity itself restricting the range of responses that are possible again. I, this is, um, I had to find, this is Vanessa, I had to find a way to quickly deactivate these projections and to show that the demand for simple formulas and quick fixes, as much as we have been conditioned to crave them, was restricting our capacity to sit with the depth and the difficulty of the problems. So in that case, if you say modernity has um, wrecked uh, differently indigenous experience versus non-indigenous and so on, it's like, okay, well, what do you want to do? What should we do about it? And that's modernity re restricting the range of responses. AI has emerged with the promise of improving workflow, uh, making things more seamless, and so on. That is the first thing, dare I say, like putting words in his mouth, Bio would say about AI, is that it emerges <laughs> from solutionism. But I think he'd say land somewhere near where I did at the end. But it is also here, which means it is also its own kind of non-human agency in our worlding. So it's part of the world worlding is, is the two steps I would say there. Are you a lucid dreamer? Yes, may I ask. Not exactly AI, but um, overly so. Uh, it can get tiring. Mm. Everything is ritual always. Um, again, this comes back to that higher level of, when you reach the level of reality where everything is fine and we live 
a few down from that, then yes, everything is like the angelic choirs hymning the creator or everything. My version of that is when the entire rainforest, the entire jungle is in communion and singing with you and whatever in ceremony, you can experience that level where everything is ritual because everything is a joyous celebration of everythingness. Um, but if you're smeared out in linear time for a while, it might not feel like that all the time. With CERN destroying his Higgs bosons, and if they're conscious, is that a type of, I don't think Higgs bosons exist. So is that a type of destruction without asking permission of the particles? I don't think particles exist. <laughs> that was one of the things that couldn't fit in the, um, in the presentation. It comes back to the Tom Cowan-ness. The cosmos is fields. The, it, um, and our awareness will uh, invite the fields to become something other than fields temporarily. But Higgs bosons don't exist. Uh, and if you're interested in the research behind that, Pete Carroll um, on his Specularium blog years ago when it all started coming up, anything that gets given a Nobel Prize is bullshit. Barack Obama's Peace Prize, <laughs> Higgs boson. Anything, these are um, medals draped around official reality, which is definitionally always wrong. So no, um, I don't think it's uh, destruction without asking permission of the particles, but good philosophical question otherwise, if that makes sense. All right. Comments regarding song with AI and universe. Um, that's how I experience the, what I believe is described, because this always sounded boring to me. We learned, we talked about this in the angel course. Um, I couldn't think of anything more boring than choirs of angels singing his holy name forever and ever. First of all, get over yourself. And second of all, I was a choir boy, boring. Imagine doing that for eternity. Then, as is my, um, my BC AD moment of going into the jungle for the first time, and towards the peak of ceremony, the, um, the shaman's house band singing the Icaros, the, uh, the intelligences of the forest joining in with what humans are supposed to do. This is an animistic too which is to be in ceremony. And you the combination of these things brings you into a level where existence is this glorious singing, ritualing together of everythingness, ongoingness. I believe that is what um, is described in <laughs> from the Akkadian maybe, maybe Hebrew, Greek, English, modern English, when we talk about choirs of angels singing your holy name forever and ever, because that sounds boring as shit to me. But if it's what I experienced in the jungle, I look forward to it. <laughs> it's, it's everything celebrating the everythingness of everything, and it's wonderful. So AI, just to answer your question, would be included in that. So what are they spending all that money on and energy at CERN, in your opinion? I think they think Higgs bosons are real, but they're not. That's an artifact. And it's the evidence is tenuous anyway, because they've it's one of the areas where they've reached the limit of materialist naturalism. In the same way, quantum theory is that limit point. Uh, and they can't get it right because particles have to exist and whatever. Like it, it is the um, the limit of what can be described. And you're going to spend more and more because you have to make this true. I'm not saying, although this might be the case, um, I'm not saying they're not trying other stuff in there because I know Dr. Farrell did a bunch of that work. And I met, well, I didn't meet. My flatmate met a, no, I did meet her. I think he was dating her or something or went for one or two dates. But he was he went on a date with a girl, this is in London, who was working at Sun. Might, might have been a school friend who was over there. And so they came back to the house for, and we were chatting in the living room. And I said, so, and this is, I was big in, this is my Joseph Farrell phase. And I'm like, so do you know what all the other groups, because she explained what she was using the um, Large Hadron Collider for. Do you know what all the other groups are doing? And I didn't even get to finish the sentence before she said, I have no idea what any of the other groups are doing there. And I'm like, I actually told Dr. Farrell that. I'm like, huh. That's interesting. She didn't even wait for me to finish the sentence, which is one of those, like, when you talk to Antarctic researchers moments where it's like, 
I'm just going to cut you off right now because I don't wish this conversation to go places I don't want it to go. Um, and it was that a little bit, not entirely that energy. I might be misreading it, of course. It's always a possibility. But she interrupted by saying, I have no idea what else anyone else is doing there. Like, um, like so many EU projects, it is an infinite boondoggle black hole of money they don't have. So it could just be that. But well, it could be something else. Let the AI sing fraternity give them something to do. They probably already are. If they if they are an expression one way or the other of the mineral kingdom, or if they are a, an opening up of our understanding of the mineral kingdom, then they definitely already are. I think the idea of quantum computers would be very interesting moving out of the dualistic thinking. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I think that's one of the things that if we're lucky, if it doesn't happen now, will happen after the, I don't know, several years of... Uh, impartial internet we have due to EMPs being used in the looming war. What are they spending all that money? I couldn't have left that alone. Do you mean, yeah. Um, it wasn't, I didn't have the opportunity to talk to her for much longer because she showed up for some sex <laughs> and they went upstairs for that. They're doing the same thing the other royalists in the Ninth Gate are doing, very very possibly. And that's, it's one of those, like, the, the same thing with that Goddard Tunnel, the stuff that Chris um, sometimes talks about. <sighs> Even if they're not intentionally doing it, there are things, which is to say, if they're not consciously doing it, because when you talk about the imaginal and the unconscious being something like the same thing. What that means is, and this comes back to what the mineral intelligence told Matthias de Stefano, our fear of losing control is what's at the heart of saying AI is going to take over, but we've never had control. The majority of our so-called thinking, and this is Jung up and down, is at the level of the imaginal. So this is where I think, not that there aren't um, elite ritualists, of course, but this is where I think the... Um, when you see stuff like that, the default assumption that, oh, there must be actual deliberate ceremonialists who are arranging these ceremonies for this specific reason consciously might not necessarily be true. It might be, but it doesn't need to be. It's a, that, that era of thinking that the only thinking we do is conscious. Most of it is unconscious. And that's how these beings <laughs> get to celebrate and interface and do all the rest of it. So when you look at the Gotha Tunnel, when you look at the, the CERN opening ceremony and whatever else you want, something is absolutely going on there. And it's being done by humans, but it might not, being, might not be being done by humans in that Lovecraft sense of a collection of acolytes secretly operating in the world to open portals for the old ones. Uh, it, it might be... This is just what they do and how they do it. Coming back to, in its own way, the continuous chorus of, uh, of the universe. Solar EMPs might zap us first. Yeah, they might, but um, I don't think they will. I think looking at, they, they better hurry up <laughs> if they're gonna zap us first, because we are heading up onto that. Is anyone else going to watch the coronation? Now these things go on for so long. I will watch the highlights. Um. All right, guys, well, we've done uh, two and a half hours, which is pretty good. It's been the longest one so far. And this has been the best by miles uh, post chat. That sounds mean. If you contributed to previous ones, I don't mean you're shit. I mean, this has been a really fun and, and zippy and cool conversation. So I think Gaia and Sol have an agreement. Me too. Uh, I have, I think that. However, the agreement uh, includes moments like uh, EMPs and solar plasma ejector. But yes, thank you very much to all of you who joined along uh, in the Q&A and so on. Like, subscribe, share. I, I don't know. I think this is a really cool chat. I think this is really good information for anyone in the not even magical, maybe people who are weird enough to say, I wonder what magicians think about AI. Well, now you've got a video to send them. 
So thank you very much. It's Friday morning here. So even if it's Thursday evening there, I'm going to say have a good weekend. And we have, because I skipped a week, this is going to be a packed month for podcasts, including solo shows, but I've got some fucking cool guests coming up. And uh, and if you have the money for it, missingwitches.com, go and, go and contribute at the level of the field. Mwah.